minor item. And so the major item is the um, <clears throat> CU South um, uh, land management as well as South Boulder Creek flood mitigation. And um, Jane, do you want to take it away? Sure, thank you so much. My role here is very simple. I am introducing you to Joe Tadeucci, our Director of Utilities, who will start our presentation and then introduce the other presenters. Um, so, Joe. Okay. Um, thank you, Jane, and good evening, City Council. We're here to talk tonight about the South Boulder Creek Flood Mitigation Project, as well as the annexation of CU South. And I am joined here tonight by my two co-presenters. We have uh, Brandon Coleman on my left, who is an engineering project manager in utilities engineering. He's been leading all of the concept design work on the project. And on my right, I have Phil Kleisler, who is a senior planner in our planning department. And he has been doing all of the heavy lifting on the annexation and coordinating with the university. And I really want to acknowledge both of their efforts. They have done a tremendous amount of work um, in order for us to be able to have this conversation tonight. Brandon has been working hard, leading the, the concept design, working with our consultants, getting the report together, getting the memo and this presentation together. And similarly, Phil has been doing the same on the annexation side. So very thankful for their efforts. And before I turn it over to them, I wanted to set the stage for the conversation tonight. At, our, at the council retreat in January, uh, we, we talked about this project a little bit, and I remember mentioning that um, we have, with the flood mitigation project, one of the most complex uh, projects that utilities has ever done. And uh, the annexation is probably the most complicated annexation the city's ever been faced with. And in order for this to all work, the two of them have to be done in, in sync and side by side. The good news for tonight is that we don't have to talk about every aspect of the complexities of, of those two things. And we have really tried to narrow in with our presentations and the information in our memo on, on the things that will allow the project to move forward. And so um, a number of complexities involved, one of them being land ownership. And quite often with utilities projects, we don't own the property that we're uh, developing on, whether it's flood mitigation or pipelines or, or things like that. And it's really important to us uh, to maintain good working relationships with uh, property owners. We frequently have impacts on open space pro property and have had a, a good working relationship with the open space board and staff. Similarly, we work frequently with the university on things as well as the Department of Transportation. And so this particular project with, with all those things in mind has a lot of um, competing objectives and in order for us to move it forward, it's gonna take hard work and compromise. And I'm um, really feeling good about the work that we've done leading up to tonight. And I think we have a real opportunity with this study session to start taking steps forward. I wanna thank the staff um, from other departments. There are a number of people who are here tonight to support the conversation and who have been really supporting this project for years now, and it's been a heavy lift for them. And so they're here if you have questions in other areas that the three of us can't answer. And I also wanted to offer a special thank you and welcome to the University of Colorado. Uh, Francis Draper and Derek Silva are here tonight, and they have agreed to participate in the annexation uh, part of the conversation, and so we're we're really looking forward to the conversation tonight. Um, as, as far as our agenda, if you wanna flip to the next slide, we've broken this into two parts. Brandon will talk first about the concept design and uh, we'll leave some space for questions or discussion. And I imagine both presenters, if you have questions while we're going, feel free to interrupt or, or ask as needed. And then we'll switch gears and talk about the annexation 
process and uh, with uh, Phil and the representatives from the university. And at the end, we'll talk about next steps and, and we've put together some potential questions and feedback areas for city council. So um, with that, I will turn it over to Brandon for the concept design. Uh, good evening. Uh, like Joe said, I'm Brandon Coleman. I'm an uh, engineering project manager in the stormwater flood utility for the city. Um, I've been leading the efforts on this project and um, just want to go over quickly what we're going to talk about tonight. So really, I think it's important there's a few new council members to get everybody up to speed on the project. The project has a long history. Um, South Boulder Creek's a pretty complex watershed. So um, we're going to start with just general flat facts about South Boulder Creek then move into a history of the flood mitigation project, then go over the current analysis and the results that we found, and then finally we'll talk about trade-offs um, uh, associated with the project. So South Boulder Creek uh, is a 27-mile long uh, creek. It in the watershed encompasses about 136 square miles, and as you can see from this map, uh, only a small portion of it actually sits within the city of, of Boulder. Um, and the city limits here are shown on the black outline, and it actually uh, discharges t into Boulder Creek on the east side of town. So South Boulder Creek is similar to a lot of these front range drainages in the fact that the um, upper areas of the watershed are very steep and very mountainous, so that really defines a very tight floodplain. And as you can see, as you come into the lower watershed area, um, it discharges from the mountains and enters the plains area. And when it does that, the floodplain will spread out and it becomes a little more unpredictable and it has much more variability. And that's really where it enters the city. So um, that's what makes this project so complex. Uh, the watershed has a few key main features. Uh, Gross Reservoir, which serves as water supply for Denver water, is located in the middle watershed. On this map, um, there's major roadway crossings across South Boulder Creek, particularly State Highway 93 and US 36. Um, there's numerous irrigation diversions and also irrigated lands um, adjacent to South Boulder Creek. Okay, so just to get everybody um, on the same page, I think it's important we just cover a few terms that you guys are going to hear a lot tonight, and everybody's on the same page. This is a map of the property that we'll be talking about tonight, but um, I just wanted to get some general flood terms uh, out there for everybody to understand. So um, when you hear floodplain, what we're talking about is the area that we expect water to be covering during a flooding event. Um, so in this example, this is a 100-year floodplain for the property. Um, a 100-year floodplain represents a 1 in 100 chance of flooding in any given year, um, and it's also the base regulatory floodplain for FEMA. So the 500-year floodplain is a larger flood event. Um, it's represented here. You can see the boundaries usually extend a little bit further than the 100-year floodplain, and it depends mainly on topography and uh, the flow rates that you see of how that looks. And uh, it spans much larger than 100 year. So the high hazard zone shown here in the pink shading is uh, regulatory for the city of Boulder in particular, and it indicates the greatest risk to life safety. So you can see we have high hazard um, around the property. And what that is really defining that for the city is depths of four feet or greater, and also a calculation of depth times velocity, and that equates to a flood flow that could potentially sweep somebody off of their feet. And lastly, you'll hear a lot of discussion tonight about the levy. Um, so there is a levy on the property. Uh, a levy is just an embankment constructed to contain flows from any given water body. In this case, it's containing flows from South Boulder Creek, and levees typically run in the direction of flow. So South Boulder Creek, I think it's important being in the stormwater flood utility to point out that South Boulder Creek is just one of 16 major drainage ways across the city. Boulder has um, the highest flood, flash, flood, flash flood risk 
um, to life and safety in the state of Colorado. And this map really represents all the drainage ways that cross the city. And uh, South Boulder Creek is on the very far right side and it's just one of the drainage ways. And there's also approximately 25% of the structures in Boulder are located within the 100 year floodplain. So South Boulder Creek does have a history of flooding. Um, there have been three major flooding events uh, that have happened in 1938. There was a flood event and then that was prior to the uh, construction of Gross Reservoir. It really impacted El Dorado Springs area, as you can see on the picture on the left. In 1969, there was a major flood that actually overtopped 36 and um, flowed in the area we'll be talking to, commonly referred to as the West Valley Overflow Area. And then again, most recently in 2013, um, there was a major flooding event that did overtop US 36 and <coughs> flowed um, in that same West Valley overflow area and um, was pretty dramatic. Uh, we've used this picture numerous times, it's a pretty stark picture that this is in a neighborhood in Boulder um, and really a primary driver for why we wanna get this flood mitigation project done. So, like I said, one of the primary drivers is really protecting life and safety for the residents in the city of Boulder. Um, so you can see here the property that we're gonna be discussing is outlined in red, and the area of flooding that we're really trying to address is this West Valley overflow area. So on the right of this oval, you'll just see South Boulder Creek uh, proper, and then what happens is uh, US 36 pushes the flood flows over into these neighborhoods into the West Valley area, um, highlighted in yellow here. So this project has a long project history. Um, it's tough to cover everything about the project history, so I'm gonna run through it pretty quickly and hit some of the major milestones. Uh, so for our stormwater flood utility, typically for projects like this, we follow a life cycle of where we first map and identify the flood risk. Next, we come up with a mitigation plan to mitigate the hazards from those flood risks. Um, third, we do construction of those recommended measures. And then lastly, we remap the floodplain um, to see what the benefits are of the project. So floodplain mapping for this project started in 2003 and was accepted uh, as regulatory for the city in 2008 and then accepted by FEMA in 2010 as regulatory. And in 2000, this was the mapping study that really identified and quantified the flood risk associated with the West Valley overflow. So from that mapping study, we began the mitigation planning process, commonly referred to as the master planning process. Um, that was done from 2010 to 2015, and we looked at numerous alternatives throughout the drainage. And what we came up was with a recommended plan uh, in 2015 that recommended three phases of flood <coughs> mitigation for South Boulder Creek. Uh, phase one is highlighted in red on the map on the right and that's the regional detention at US 36, and that's what we're gonna be talking about tonight. So that's where this flood mitigation concept came from, and it's important to note that it's only phase one of three phases to mitigate um, flood risk in the South Boulder Creek drainage. So we did identify that during the master plan process, a significant amount of the flood mitigation project would be located on the CU South property, which is currently owned by CU Boulder. So the city, the county, and the university all began the process of identifying um, property, property guide, guiding principles for the property um, associated with the CU South site. And this was really to guide an annexation of the property and also incorporate the flood mitigation goals. And that was accepted by all parties in 2017. And that allowed us to begin the concept design, um, which is when we're doing the concept design, we're taking that phase one and really looking for ways to improve cost estimates, efficiencies in the project, and um, really look at the feasibility of the project. So in 2019, we were directed to begin on the variant one configuration uh, for a 500 year level flood protection. So to protecting against the 500 year flood we discussed, and that's the current phase of the project we're in right now. This map shows all the components of the project, the blues, the inundation area, so the area that would be ponded during an event. The brown is showing an embankment and flood wall to detain the flood waters. The green showing an area of excavation to create the detention volume we're gonna need. 
and the yellow is our outlet structure under US 36 that would be discharging back to South Boulder Creek. So now we're coming to the current analysis. Um, this analysis is related to the variant one 500 year configuration I just uh, showed. And in July, we brought the issue to council that um, the 500 year configuration actually inundates more of the property than was designated for flood mitigation. Uh, this was a map presented by CU Boulder at that meeting uh, that was in the interest of them working with the city to continue to look at ways to provide flood mitigation on the site. And really what you're seeing, the map's a little busy, but the important things to point out are the red hatch lines or the area of inundation that's gonna be impacted. And then the green lines where the arrow is, is where they um, thought we would be able to offset those inundation impacts by potentially um, using that land in that property. And one of the key criteria was maintaining 129 acres of developable land and that was really because that was what was agreed to in the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan Guiding Principles. So I, I really like this slide. I think it gives you a good overview of the project area and the area in general. Uh, so this slide is actually looking to the south across the site. You can see Table Mesa in the foreground and this is a rendering of what the project would look like out there. And I'll point out some key features from here. And I always like to point out from this vantage point that South Boulder Creek is quite a ways away from the property. You can see it in the background there in the tree line. It has a leader called out. And what's happening is the floodwaters are coming down South Boulder Creek and they're actually hitting US 36 and starting to flow towards the Table Mesa area. So um, you, We'll also hear a lot about the existing access road, which is South Loop Drive, and we're showing here, highlighted in yellow, um, the proposed embankment to get that road over our embankment as part of the project. Next in brown here, you'll see the actual embankment that would be on CU South property, and as we go along US 36, that would transition to a flood wall really to limit our impacts. And then lastly, this is really the concept of the project. So floodwaters would be flowing out of the screen towards us, and the intention of the design is to capture those floodwaters and then release them in a controlled manner back to South Boulder Creek. So our current concept of design analysis was really looking at ways to offset those inundation impacts, and we looked at that in two ways mainly, which was uh, the land swap that I mentioned before, so really um, providing developable land that met the requirements of the guiding principles, and then also looking at reducing the level of flood protection to um, reduce the amount of detention volume we needed and the inundation area associated with that detention volume. So this is a layout of the project for the 100-year flood protection. Um, and so the area of fill is denoted in orange, so currently that is not in the floodplain, but with the project being put in place, that would now become part of the floodplain. So that's why we've considered that area as part of the project because those would be changes to the floodplain generated by part of the project. Um, and then you can see again in brown is the embankment and the flood wall. The green is the area of excavation. The blue is the area of inundation. And lastly, the yellow is our outlet uh, structure, which would discharge Davili Channel, which is another major drainage way in the city of Boulder, and that ultimately reports back to South Boulder Creek. So next, we took the 500-year flood protection and considered a land swap um, associated with the inundation impacts. Um, what's really important to point out here is the area of fill is quite a bit larger than the 100-year, and it's located in a different area. And what's happening here is the area that we were proposing for a land swap would not be developable under the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan guiding principles. So we had to include fill above the 500-year flood elevation to make that land developable. And when we do that, you actually need to connect into high ground, which is on the left side of the screen. So that's why this area of fill is so much larger than the previous um, slide for the 100-year flood protection. 
So lastly, we wanted to see if there was a midpoint and see what actually we could trade out um, to get kind of the combination of these and see if we could reduce the storm event, reduce our inundation impacts, but also consider the land swap and see if there was any um, middle ground that would be good to find. So we selected a 200-year flood event because we had existing hydrology um, to support this and to be able to model this in the uh, time that we've had. And what we found was we still need a larger detention volume and inundation area, but not as much as the 500-year flood. And we were able to put fill in the detention area, as you can see here, and then also we were filled some of that other area in the lower fill that, sorry, I'm probably a little confusing here. So what happened was there's fill next to the inundation area that we were able to use, but we still need more detention volume than the 100 year. And then to offset the inundation impacts associated with this, we don't need as much fill as the 500 year, but we still need a significant amount to be able to tie into high ground. So. I'd be happy to explain that further. It's kind of a complicated uh, concept. So what we found from this is really that fill is a big differentiator for the different projects to be able to meet that land swap. So the flood mitigation, just the flood mitigation components, the flood wall, the outlet structure, the excavation, are relatively similar for all the projects. We see that we need a bigger embankment and a taller flood wall for the higher level of flood protection but ultimately the infrastructure is relatively similar. Um, for option one, which is the 100 year, we do need earth fill associated with our changes to the floodplain, so that's where that $10 million comes from. But for option two and option three, which are the 500 and 200 year flood protection, that area of fill to generate that land swap is significant and does have some significant costs associated with it. So our costs range from 66 to 96 million, um, depending on what level of flood protection. So for the levy, I just want to be very clear that the levy and the land use, the land uses for the site are connected. Um, it's really important to point that out because our guiding principles do talk a lot about the levy and what is allowable in area protected by levy and the 500 year floodplain. So this is the levee on the site, the orange. Um, and as you can see, the lighter green is the OSO area, which is actually the floodplain that is being protected by levee. So to be able to generate any developable land in that area, we would need to fill that essentially to meet the requirements in the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan guiding principles. Next, uh, the most one of the more important things that we found was really the hydraulic design criteria for the project was that we can't impact negatively impact any downstream users. Um, and to really manage that, there's only two hydraulic control points that we have control of. Um, one is the existing bridge over US 36, which is managed by CDOT, and that would be our first downstream user and we don't want to impact that bridge, so we want to maintain existing flow conditions at that bridge. And this is just a picture of the bridge as it exists today, and we really want to keep that criteria um, the same for what is going under that bridge currently. And really, our only way to do that is to change the size of our outlet, and our outlet has some limiting features on it as well. So our outlet shown here, I'm showing the downstream area because we can only discharge so much water out of our outlet before we start negatively impacting the neighborhoods downstream of Vili Channel, and that's East Boulder Rec Center at the top of the screen. Um, and also there's constructability issues with the outlet. We can't do five or six outlets because there's just not space. So when we say constructability, there's just a space limitation on how many outlet structures we can actually put under US 36. Uh, another really important consideration for the city is just the environmental impacts of the project. Um, there's, in the South Boulder Creek area here, there is um, very important habitat, uh, there's endangered and threatened species, threatened and endangered species, including the Preble's jump, jumping mouse and the Ute Lady Truss orchid. 
Um, it's some of the some prime grazing area for our open space department. They use it um, for agriculture and uh, so. Part of the direction we got in July was really to reach out to the Open Space Board of Trustees and get their feedback on the flood wall as well. So what's happened um, since that conceptual design came out is our flood wall has to be located on the OSMP property right next to the adjacent CDOT right of way. And this is direct impacts to open space. And we did receive uh, board feedback, which is part of the memo packet. and uh, the. Most important piece of that feedback we found was that uh, it would likely involve a disposal of this property from open space. So uh, this is estimated at five acres. It's a 90-foot offset uh, along US 36 that we would need for construction and ultimately for the flood wall to sit on. Brandon, I have a question. Yeah. Previous slide. What is that notch there right below the bike path label? Um. Make sure I'm following here. Right here? No, uh, bike path, where it says bike path. Yeah, Underneath US, right yeah, right here. there. That little notch there. Uh, I, this may be, I, I'm not 100% sure, but it's more than likely a discharge point. Um, there's multiple drainages that come under US 36 here already to address the local drainages. So it's probably a change in the right of way to accommodate one of those drainages, most Thank likely. You. So um, project staff has tried to identify some differentiators and also trade-offs associated with going with each of these levels of flood protection. You've probably heard a lot of them so far in the presentation. Um, so in your packet, there is a table that has more details on this. This is a summary of that table. But mainly what the project team found through this analysis was, um, number one, project feasibility becomes more challenging with the higher level of flood protection that we select. Um, number two is costs significantly increase to provide um, flood mitigation above the 100-year flood level. Uh, three, the impacts associated with the project are also much larger above the 100-year, and that's mainly related to that fill that we discussed previously. And then um, Lower design flood events also gives us a little more flexibility with the hydraulic design criteria that I mentioned before. So that may benefit us from a permeability, a permit ability standpoint. So when we're getting our permits. So I have a quick question. Um, on our flood, uh, sorry, our, our CU South tours that we took, we learned that there are concerns with the 500 year and the South Boulder Creek Bridge at US 36. Um, do you want to tell us about those now? Because doesn't that also have an impact on what we could or couldn't do as far as 500-year flood project? Yes, and sure. So um, I think I, I led some of those discussions during the tour, and I think Brandon mentioned a few slides ago that uh, the hydraulic design criteria, and so in order to get CDOT approval on this project, we need to keep the the flow conditions underneath the bridge um, to existing conditions. We can't make it any worse. If, if, our, if we built a flood wall and it would result in water levels being higher at the bridge or velocity increasing or, or something like that, it's going to be difficult for the uh, Department of Transportation to give us a a right-of-way permit for that. So that is a, a fundamental piece of our design criteria. And what Brandon was saying is the two ways we, ha we have to pass water th with this design is through the bridge or our outlet works. And there are physical limitations to just how much capacity we can build into the outlet works. And so we were not able to, with all of the modeling that we did, we were not able to meet that criteria of maintaining existing conditions or better for the um, CDOT bridge. So that one will be tricky for feasibility going forward. Okay, and so that was only for the 500? That was for the 500, yeah. Great, thank you. Bob? Well, a question. So um, <clears throat> just to kind of put an underline that, does that effectively mean, Joe, that um, 
he never likes to say anything's impossible, but but 500 year would be improbable for, from an engineering standpoint. Forget about the cost, but just from a engineering and CDOT standpoint, it's 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 not an option that's you're recommending or that's very likely to be available to us. Yeah, I I couldn't guarantee that we would be able to get that one through the permitting process. And when you combine that um, hydraulic or engineering feasibility with all of the other trade-offs on on the chart, it may not be worth bringing that one forward. Okay, thanks. Okay. Okay. Oh, yep. I'm sorry, I was looking at the chart, so you may have already answered it, but is that the same analysis for 200? Is that also unlikely, or is it just the 500? It, it we, it's easier to do with the 200, so we can get closer, but we still haven't been able to get those two flows to match at this point. Brandon, I might just ask you to speak a little more directly into the microphone for sure. our viewers. Okay. Hopefully that hasn't been going the whole time. <laughs> um, okay. All right. Um, and lastly, I, I do just want to point out that we have been given direction to proceed with the preliminary design related to this variant one configuration. And as you saw in the uh, concept uh, layouts that all the flood components are relatively similar. So we are proceeding with that design where we've completed phase one of our geotechnical inv investigations, which is actually giving us information on the soils and the groundwater at the site. Um, we're currently doing phase two of those geotechnical inv investigations on the site. And that's informing our groundwater modeling, um, which we've started for the site. And we're also producing a hydraulic model that is essentially um, updating all the existing conditions on the site. So that way we'll be able to use that as we proceed through the preliminary design. So I just wanted to note that those activities are still ongoing. Um, so just to follow up on that and thank you for it, um, <clears throat> does that mean that we're continuing to make progress towards one of these options uh, at this point as we're doing the geotechnical studies and we're doing the, the flood analysis? We what we learn doesn't foreclose anything yet. It's just letting us move forward, and this work would have to be done regardless of which option we went with. That's that's correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, I do want to put a project timeline in here. Um, as I said, we are working on the uh, preliminary design and there will be a point where we come back to council in May and we're really looking for direction on what level of flood protection we're gonna continue through that preliminary design. And then from there, um, as Phil's gonna talk about next, is uh, the annexation is actually a big driver of the project because like Joe mentioned, um, Typically, we don't own the property where we're trying to do our project, so the way we would get this property to be able to do this project is through that annexation process. Um, so there's some unknowns there. That's why we have two TBD right at the construction uh, date. It's really, we can't start construction until we have the property or the um, approvals to be able to impact those properties. And at what point would you be able to begin construction? Because there's the other federal agencies that are involved in permitting, correct? So we would need to make it through, even if annexation magically happened, we would still have whatever time it takes to get through the Corps of Engineers, Fish and Wildlife, um, State Dam Engineer, and whoever else. Is that right? That's, that's correct. And typically for a project this complex, it can take two or three years to, to get those permits in place and all of the approvals that you need. And we've been having some advanced discussions with some of the agencies like the Department of Transportation to just make sure that we're comfortable, there's a feasible path through those. Um, but definitely we'll know more. And one of the first things we would do moving into the preliminary design would be to really map out the, the schedule for this in detail. But we, we need to know what the project is before we can really do that. And, and you had talked, I think previously, correct me if I'm wrong, that it was at about a 30% design level that you were able to start the conversations with the federal agencies? That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. How many agencies are involved in this and which do you regard as the most problematic in terms of getting approvals? 
I don't know that I'd want to say which one's the, the most problematic, but um, <laughs> <laughs> they might be listening. How many agencies? Uh, I'll settle for that. <laughs> So uh, I don't know off the top of my head how what the number is, but um, the FEMA, the state FEMA is for the flood protection part of it. The state engineer is for the dam design and dam safety component of it. So those are two big engineering approvals. There's the Corps of Engineers, the Fish and Wildlife Service. There's a City of Boulder wetland permit. Um, those are the ones that come to mind off the top of my head. I think we, the Department of Transportation as well. Sorry to forget that one. Um, and we just, uh, we're on the verge of completing another very complex project in utilities right now, and that's the Carter Lake Pipeline. And all, most of those entities that I just mentioned were involved in permitting, as well as irrigation ditch companies. The, the landowners have to approve all of this. So I would say there's probably the most complexity associated with the, the land use and the landowner agreements. And does CDOT, in the current design, does CDOT also have an approval? They do. We would need a right-of-way permit from them. Anytime we, like when we're building a pipeline that's going across US 36 or some other highway of theirs, um, we need a right-of-way permit. We quite frequently have those with utilities projects, and there's a pretty standard process through that. This is the most complicated in that regard as well in terms of what our ask of them. But their, their highway benefits from the flood project as well and keeping it from overtopping, they, they recognize that. And so in our re recent discussions, the, we acknowledge the complexity, but they said, let's find a solution to this. Thank you. Joe, do all three of these options um, require an open space disposal process? Yes. So that would be another process that would be added to all of that. Yep. And in A that- The landowner, yep, that's their approval. And so, oh, that was one of the landowners that yep. you were referring to. And in that process, there was the, the open space board of trustees um, made a, had a finding that um, it, that flood mitigation was not um, charter use. Uh, but they can't decide whether or not there should be a disposal, correct? Yeah, that's that probably a, a question oh, yeah. for Tom to answer. That's right, Mary. And so that needs to come to council. Yes. So there's that. Their decision is, is advisory only. You make okay. the final decision on okay, so that's the disposal is required in the interpretation of the charter. Okay. So that would be another piece of the puzzle that needs would need to get put into the final schedule. And, and the Carter Lake pipeline that I just mentioned crossed a number of open space uh, properties, and, and we were able to work through the details and, and navigate that with our open space staff and the board of trustees and received a disposal for that. So that comes up quite frequently on our utilities projects, and, and there is definitely a, a path through that. I think on this particular project, the Open Space Board of Trustees is really interested in, in um, the feedback they provided to council in 2019, and I, I believe as well in 2018, and having those questions answered. Uh, normally, we would do that when a board has, has feedback on a project, so we would definitely be looking for guidance from council tonight or your, your blessing to pursue that. Got it, Aaron. A couple quick follow-ups on that. And, and there were different impacts from these different options on that sensitive open space that might need to be disposed. Are you going to talk about that later? Um, I, we can actually talk about that now. So. One component of the, or one feature of the flood mitigation design is the flood wall. And um, it, it has to tie into the CDOT embankment at the bridge. And so for the lower flood levels, that can occur further to the west, or likely can further to the west, which would mean the flood wall could be shorter and near South Boulder Creek. 
and that is uh, that is the area that has the most uh, sensitive habitat for open space property, and so um, it could potentially be a couple hundred feet shorter, and so that would be an important distinction, and that's one of the things that in Brandon's presentation when he said the lower flood levels, there's some advantages to feasibility. It's things like that. Do you have a, can you quantify that in terms of a different impact on that sensitive ecological habitat? Well, if the wall was uh, it terminated or ended 200 feet further to the west, it would be that much shorter. And so the, the 200 feet, say, by 90 feet in, in the width of the corridor that we would have to disturb for the project, that could potentially be left undisturbed. So it, substantial I, anyway. Yeah. I mean, you, maybe you don't have a percent at hand, but it's a substantial lessening of impact. Yeah, it, it could potentially be the, uh, I think Brandon showed the slide going with the flood wall going all the way to the creek and mentioned five Im acres of impact. So it could be 4.2 or something like that. Rachel, what, what did you just get more information? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was. I saw uh, a phone yeah. a friend happening there. As as Joe's mentioned, we've been working with open space very closely here. So um, uh, one of the benefits of its important habitat because it's riparian to open space, um, but the critical habitat for the Preble's jumping mouse is actually from the center line of South Boulder Creek, about 140 meters either way. So the further away we can move the flood wall from the creek, the more likely we, we'd be able to get out of that Preble's habitat, and that helps us um, from a project standpoint as well as reducing our environmental impacts. Right. And I did, I, there was a number in the packet, and I, I did just find it, I mean, the, the, the packet quantified it as five acres of endangered species habitat impact for the 500 year and 0.9 acres impact in the 100 year. So is that, Dan, I see you back there, is that, so that's like an 80% reduction. Yeah. That yeah, and uh, the, the flood wall impacts are gonna be similar aside from that shorter length. What happens is, is that fill associated with the OSO, um, there's threatened and endangered species all over the property, and uh, Ute Ladies Trusses orchid are one of the species, and those don't have a defined um, habitat location, but they're they're managed on a plant by plant basis, and the way you mitigate for those is by offsetting the acres. So if you're impacting their habitat, you would likely offset for the acreage. Yeah. Great. But the, that fundamental of the kind of 80% reduction was what I was getting out of the packet anyway. But, so one, one other follow-up question here, and, and in terms of the necessity for this, you, um, you have to have at least some of that impact from all these different variants, although less from the 100 year. But that's not dependent on what CU's doing, right? Like if CU built nothing anywhere, we would still need to put the flood wall up against um, the highway, right? Correct. Okay, so just wanted that, that that's, that sensitive habitat impact is independent of the landowners and, you know, actions, right? So yeah. Rachel and then Mirabai. Um, so I have a lot of questions. Are we just asking essentially project timeline and then following up on these right now, or is it fair game for all of them? So the, the goal we had set at the beginning at CAC was to go over the technical questions first to try and get through the flood design um, kind of questions. So going All technical into, questions pertaining to the flood wall design are now? Go. I don't know. Are, we, are you done with, you got through your timeline. Are you to questions yet? Yep, so that, that was my last Next slide. slide. Right. Okay. So then, yes, Rachel. All right, so um, I just want to uh, jump out ahead. So following up on Aaron's question, that's true also, the 0.9 acres, um, table two on page 12 for endangered species habitat. It's 0.9 acres lost for the 100-year mitigation, and it's uh, five acres lost for 500, but also for 200, right? It's, it's no better under 200 than 500? Yes. Okay, so then is, in light of that, is 200 or 500-year mitigation likely even permittable in your estimation? I would say at this stage in the project, it would be more challenging. Um, I, if that's the goal of the project is what the agencies would consider, um, then we would 
obviously ask, but it would be more challenging. Okay, not that I want to encroach on those additional 4.1 acres regardless, but I'm, I'm concerned separately whether it would be permittable if we chose two or 500. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one. Um, you, you showed on the second to last slide maybe the, the five acres along the bottom that would be needed of OSBT land. I was hoping for like an exact explanation of those acres um, and a number. I know that there's some distinction between acres that are temporarily um, impacted and then permanently impacted. So I wanted to get clarification on that. Can you speak to the, the difference between the temporary construction easement and the, and the yes. permanent? Yes, so um, this five acres is estimated at that 90 feet from the CDOT right of way. And that is, a lot of that's for construction access because we'll um, hopefully have some access in the CDOT right of way, but we are gonna need access. And there's a lot of groundwater infrastructure associated with the project. So the constructability of that um, is, requiring a lot of that access. When we're done with the project, a lot of the infrastructure will be underground and hopefully that 90 acres is only temporary and we can reduce the amount of impacts associated with that, but it's 90, 90 feet. feet. Sorry, <laughs> yes, Better. thank you. I, I um, guess I'm, I'm still trying to, to quantify, like when we get to disposal, how many acres need to be disposed of? And this is our best estimate right now. We would hope to be able to reduce this as we come up with the design details. Okay. So once we know exactly um, how much space we have in certain areas, we would like to be able to reduce this, but this is our best estimate um, at this time. Okay, um, and then I think this is a question for Tom on, on that issue. When we look at, um, when we get to OSBT um, and disposal, OSBT would be essentially disposing of land to the city and not to CU, right? So it's not really part of the, the CU South. It's, it's more what we need for flood mitigation, so coming to the city. Yeah, so the land is already owned by the city, so the disposal means it, who's managing it and what. Okay. It just technically takes it out from being open space land and, to, with a, and it removes that restriction. It's always okay. city property. It's managed by open station and restricted by the charter. And so a dis what a disposal does is it transfers the management to another. And we've done this in the past, for example, we've transferred bike paths to transportation. And I'm, I'm curious, how much was the, and I have a follow-up on that, but also how much of the Carter Lake project, how many acres were involved, or what was that disposal like? I don't remember the acreage. Um, I wish my mind was that good, but there was several properties that it, uh, I think four or five properties that it crossed. And um, the disposal involved open space providing an easement to utilities. In that case, it was actually Northern Water who was managing the project, but they, they provided an easement. So that once they, once they do that easement for a utility use, they no longer have the full use of the property as if it didn't have any. Okay, it, that might be helpful down the line just to know what, what that looked like since it's recent. Um, and so then back to my question, if it's, it's not, I guess this disposal seems like it's not really tethered to the CU South um, property development. And so when we look at um, what we might need to do to make open space whole and, and sort of teeing this up for questions that we're gonna ask boards, um, does that, would that land even need to be related to CU South? Could it be anywhere in the city? And how would open space, it seems like they may have two separate roles here. One is as a, a property owner that needs to dispose of these couple of acres, and then another as an advisory board that maybe, you know, wants to talk about the berm or other things happening in the project. So trying to figure out how that disposal um, issue comes from this property owner, because it's going to be a big one for us. It's a big um, hurdle. So trying to figure out what, what does that look like in terms of, of those acres and, and where OSBT will weigh in on those versus the whole project. So the, the way that worked on the Carter Lake pipeline and the way we went through that process with the open space staff and board is they, they will make a recommendation to city council and they would often include um, condition, recommended conditions for the disposal. So as it gets to the things like the berm and other areas that could be impacted 
those are the types of things that would come forward and they would recommend city of council if they were comfortable with a disposal they might recommend city council um, approval of it with the following conditions kind of thing and I guess do that does does that have to be something that comes from CU South's property or can it be anywhere in the city that we are making OSBT whole yeah, just one distinction if it if it is a disposal situation the board will actually have to approve right. the disposal not just recommend the disposals just a yeah. clarification on that and if you can introduce yourself please. yeah Dan Burke uh, director of open space mountain parks um, in regards to um, if there's uh, with a disposal package and if the board approves a disposal and it goes to council if that's where we're headed uh, with this uh, the board may be looking at what possible um, offsets to these uh, that we would get and and it would be uh, the first place that the board would typically look and where our staff would typically want to look at it is as close to the impact the original impact as possible so obviously looking at uh, where some uh, possible mitigated lands would be closer to the site uh, that replicate some of what we're disturbing would be a logical place to look so uh, it, it, it wouldn't be required that it be on CU South by any means but it certainly would be uh, that's the proximity and that's where the, the continual habitat is and so that's a likely place and our board has already expressed that thanks and, and is that like is there language in the charter that spells out um, any nexus between you know if you're forfeiting um, five acres disposing of that is it a, a as it is with permitting and regulatory agencies sort of a you know one acre might equal three acres or something like that or is it I mean I assume there's some logical rational relationship between no <laughs> uh, th uh, there's a about a two paragraph description of how the disposal process is to work uh, in 1995 the board did approve a uh, what at that time was called an easement policy a, dis a disposing of lands for easements uh, and that is uh, the policy the process that we that the board has typically used to guide its mechanism of how it goes about uh, making decisions on disposals but the charter itself does not lay out any specific uh, criteria or ratios or anything else that goes with it but that 1995 um, policy has, has been what is typically have guided the open space board of trustees over the years okay. okay and i have a quick follow-on to that actually i'll just call on mirabai i'll come back to it dan sure um, mirabai and then mary so i'm colloquying on aaron's point so if cu were to not develop at all have you guys done any studies to find out if we could do anything that would preserve the the habitat the osmp lands are there any other options ways of doing this flood mitigation if again if there was no development by CU yeah go ahead okay. um, I guess um, so as I stated previously in the project history we looked at a pretty extensive list of all types of alternatives in the master planning process and then that's what really drove us to the regional detention at CU South and then at the regional detention at CU South, um, we found that we've also looked at concepts related to that, and um, we still found this is the best concept moving forward. And it does not, this design is not reflected based on development of CU South. Okay, I just want the public to be able to yeah. hear that and be aware. <clears throat> so, uh, Mary and then Bob. So thinking back about when we were, um, when we gave the direction about looking at variant one 500 year was um, a couple things. One was that when you look at the cost difference differential between um, 100 and 500, it was like $6 million. So it was like for another $6 million we can get, um, Five, protection for a 500 year flood and then um, and then we thought well um, let's look at something interim which is what we looked at the 200 years so that's what we have before us now um, but it's looking like um, th at least the 500 and and likely the 200 are not um, very workable engineering wise so I'm wondering what 
other things could be done to, and the whole purpose of that was to mi mitigate for climate change. So what other things could be done to help mitigate for climate change? Because the, the 100 year also says that it's the least adaptable. So is there anything else that we might be able to do? So the, I, I, my understanding of the conversations of the higher level of flood protection are to kind of armor the city against the uncertainties of climate change. And, and what I will say about that is there, there's not really a scientific or regulatory basis for selecting a 200 year or 300 year or a 500 year flood as a, as a good way of mitigating climate change. It, recognizing it does provide more storage but I will say um, in my previous role as the water resources manager, we did a lot of work studying cl future climate scenarios and what impacts they might have on the city's water supply. And there are so many different scenarios that that's potentially something we could look at in the next phase of the work. Is, is there some way we could correlate that? But right now there's there's really no regulatory basis for accommodating climate change in a flood project. We, we would have to come up with something on our own as a city to do that. So on Thursday when we were touring the site, mm -hmm. um, as we were walking um, from where the truck was in our way <laughs> all the way to the bridge, um, Brandon was pointing out to me right here the flood wall would be this high at this, at the 100, it would be this high at the 500. Um, and so his point as we went down, Brandon was point, pointing that out to me. And so what I've, and, and the, oftentimes the delta between the two was, um, I don't know, 10, 15 feet, something like that. Is, am I recalling correctly? Yeah, I think the total height um, ranges from about eight to 10. Um, and it's perspective, it's in relation to US 36, so US 36 is actually ramping up towards the right. creek, and the flood wall maintains a constant elevation. Right. And then for the um, for the 500 year, it'd be a upwards of 15 feet, 15 foot tall wall. So it's really a, a nominal difference, maybe five, four to five feet there, and um, that's why you see the cost so similar for the flood mitigation okay. components. So the delta then is about five feet on, about. So what I'm wondering is, so the concern is with the 500 and the 200 is that it goes too close to the US 36 bridge. Mm -hmm. um, is there something else that could be done on our own without any kind of regulatory um, guidance to add a little bit of height to the 100 year, which would detain more water, but still could be terminated where we're talking about terminating it. Is that a feasible way to um, provide more storage? It, we could definitely look at that and, and you could make the, the flood wall six inches taller or something like that. In the dam safety component um, of designing this project, the, when you design a spillway, you come up with what's called the probable maximum flood. And your project between storage and the spillway has to accommodate that flood. And so when you do those calculations, let's say the flow rate that you came up with for your spillway, purely by the calculations, let's say it was 5,000 cubic feet per second. The state engineer's office recognizing climate change, which is, the state engineer's office is different from FEMA and the flood protection part of it, but their new regulations as of the first of this year require you to put a seven or eight percent increase on that flow, like a safety factor, recognizing climate change. So that's the, that's the example that we've seen so far in the regulatory world. It doesn't really apply to the flood design, but it will apply to our dam safety component of the design. So we could look at something like that, that would have a, an allowance for it as we continue moving this project forward. And that would still keep it within the, the wall, within the range of distance to not have an impact on the habitat. Yeah, if it was, 
If it was a nominal increase in the height of the wall, uh, it, it's all relative to the height of the wall. The, I think you mentioned the range is from eight to 15 feet tall. And so a 15 foot tall wall has to go all the way to the creek in order to have enough elevation to tie into the US 36 embankment. So if it was eight feet, six inches, I don't, you know, we haven't done a lot of analysis on that, but we could look into that as we move this forward. So I've got Bob, Adam, Rachel, and myself on the SEC. Thank you. <clears throat> Could you guys go to um, <clears throat> slide? I want to follow up on points made by Aaron and Rachel. Uh, slide 89. <clears throat> Did you go through 89 slides? No, these are back pocket. Oh. Oh. I know there's a slide 89. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> a red ahead. Okay, I think this is what Aaron was referring to when you, in the bottom table, in the middle, threatened and endangered species a nine tenths of an acre on option one versus five acre on option two and three. I think this is what you're referring to. It was in our packet as well, Aaron, right? And then getting back to Rachel's point on just on this slide before we go to another slide. <clears throat> I, I know that Joe, you said with respect to the five acre options, you don't know how many of those five acres were temporarily disrupted because of construction versus permanently disrupted because of maybe an easement that would need to take, take place for the location of the wall and maybe maintenance of the wall. Would that also apply to the nine-tenths of an acre? In other words, is there that much less disruption there and then maybe a fraction of that nine-tenths of an acre would be an easement for wall location and, and maintenance? I'm trying to remember the disposal we've done for past projects and I, th I think it was for the full um, disturbed area for the temporary construction. Okay. So if, if the question really is, is there a difference between um, permanent impact once a project is uh, designed or what you would do for temporary construction. I, I think we've typically done the temporary, but I'll defer to Dan if he. Yeah, I don't know in every, every case, but I think you're okay. right in general. And, and in this case, I, um, uh, let's say, uh, I, I believe it's 30 feet is what, what is estimated to be a, a permanent um, yeah. type of easement or transfer over and then there's the rest is a few years of temporary impact mm -hmm. uh, and what I understand from the conversation we had our board is because we're dealing with very uh, wetland type of things is digging that up and disturbing that gets to the right. point where that habitat as it was is, is really is gone for a long not time. No, I, I think we all understand that. Yeah. Okay. But anyway, in any event, regardless of whether it's permanent or temporary, let's just assume it's all permanent just for sake of discussion. To Aaron's point, um, it looks like the option one would have a significantly less impact on threatened and endangered species than the options two and three. Is that correct? Okay. Can I call a quick Sure. And then I got another slide I want to go to. Okay. So I just did the back of the envelope math so that I would have some sense of what <clears throat> the numbers were. So five acres, 218,000 square feet. And what I heard was the wall would be a couple hundred feet shorter if we were to go with option one. Is that correct? Did I hear that correctly? Potentially. Subject to the CDOT. Sure right away permitting process. And so if that happens, <clears throat> that's 18,000 square feet that don't get dis disturbed out of 218,000 square feet. So it's a relatively small change. You know, the, the dam length, assuming that the five acres is for the larger dam, that's 2,400 feet long, mm -hmm. okay? 90 acres, the math just works out, it's half a mile long. And shortening something by 200 feet um, that's a half mile to start with doesn't seem to me like it could have this large of an impact that we're seeing on this slide. So I'm just curious, you know, is that 200 feet all about the Prebles mouse and the 0.9 acres is what Utes ladies dresses occupy in the remainder? Yeah, I think the key part, and I would invite the open space staff to correct me if I get this wrong, is where that 200 feet occurs, sure. it's sure. right next it's to the down creek. Near the creek. Right. And, and the creek. that's where the critical habitat is. Yeah. And so, but the, it, we've seen a map of the Utes ladies dresses and the Prebles um, jumping mouse before. <coughs> and my recollection is the ladies dresses were kind of all over the place. I mean, they were just everywhere in there. 
Um, and so if you got a 2,400, is it like a circle that gets drawn around the plant? And then when you disturb the plant, you just have to replace that circle or something like it somewhere else? Is that how you're coming up with your 0.9? So it's important to point out here, and it may be confusing the way this slide is written, is that um, these are overall impacts. Um, so there is a portion of this that is that strip along the US 36 wall, but what's jumping up those five acres is this large area of fill and where it's located. Ah, okay. So I think that's, okay. that's really important to point out that these are overall, and um, like Dan and Joe have said, the Preble's jumping mouse in particular benefits quite a bit if we can shorten that wall. I get it. Yeah, get it. and that if we can shorten that wall enough that we would be outside of that habitat, that would be great. If we shorten it just a little bit, that's that much less critical um, federally designated habitat that we'd be impacting. I see, so yeah. maybe I misunderstood the slide. I won't divert you from yours, but at some point we'll go back to the slide that had the, the rendering the picture of the, the flood wall, the dam, <clears throat> because it said five acres in there. And so it just seemed to me like that was going to be five acres. So yeah. we'll talk about that later. Bob, go ahead. Just if you jump, to, just to follow up on Rachel's point, if you jump to slide 74, <laughs> this, this relates to the, um, I guess I'll call it exchange, to the extent that there is a disposal of some critical habitat and there is a desire to replace that with other habitat. And I get the fact that different species and different sensitivities, so this is not an apples to apples. But as I understand it from this slide, the, the darker the color, the closer it is to brown, the more critical habitat there is. Is that a correct interpretation of that slide? This is a, a suitability slide, and um, so it's a, a, a combination of things. So okay. wetlands, open water, okay. um, and then types of vegetation you have, and then okay. that gives you a suitability rating. And so the darker the uh, color, the higher the rating, and mm -hmm. it's not necessarily related to specific species. Got it, but, but I'm meaning the darker is less suitable for development and more suitable for preservation? Is that? Is, it's more desirable for from a environmental okay. uh, aspect. Yes. So, so to Rachel's point, again, we're, we're, I don't want to mix apples and apples, and I understand that you know we've got we've got uh, different types of species and flora and fauna. So I'm not trying to do an equivalency here, but it does um, seem to us that, or seem to me that we've got a lot of darkness around the edges, which I understand will be Im potentially impacted. But then we've got this this little you know appendix sticking down here in the bottom, which no one seems to really care a lot. I don't think CU cares about it. Um, and so that could be potentially land, it's, it's sensitive habitat, it's potentially land that could be exchanged, back to Rachel's point about exchanging um, acres that we, it may be unavoidable for us to impact in exchange for maybe more acres that no one really cares about other than, than those of us who care about nature who want to protect, um, protect I, I mean, from a development standpoint, there's less interest, but from a preservation standpoint, there may be greater interest. And so there may be some exchanges that could happen here, maybe even on a, on a one for X basis. In other words, we could gain more acres of, of, um, of, of critical habitat in other parts of, of, the, of the land, of CU's land, which CU is not necessarily interested in developing. Is that a fair? assumption. Yeah, and, and another good thing to point out about that area is that that could be potentially mitigation area. So like Dan said, is if we do have environmental impacts elsewhere on the site, we would want to go to the best chance we have for mitigation. So if these areas are the most suitable, um, then that may be our best mitigation potential there for just impacts from the project, not alone, uh, not only its environmental value. So. Great, thank you. Yeah. And then I've got Adam, Rachel, myself, Mark. So I had a question about permeability. Um, I assume that all of our analysis has been done without 129 acres of developed land existing, since it doesn't. Um, so have we factored that in in any way, what it, what it would look like if um, that 129 acres is then developed and what impact that would have on flow rates on, um, you know, essentially what impact that would have to the floodwaters? I, I'm not sure I under, understand the question. Is, it, is your question related to groundwater? Yeah, so you, 
My best assumption is, I'm not a hydrologist, but if you cover land with concrete or asphalt, it is no longer going to be able to absorb water. So in a major flooding event, if we have 129 acres that are now covered, that currently are not covered, it would somewhat change the hydrology of the site. It, it would, and the, uh, the fill, um, definitely the amounts that we're talking about would um, change the ability of, of rainwater to percolate into the ground. So that would be a component of it. I don't know how much of a, a contributor that would be um, during a flood, and I don't believe we've we've looked at that. But Brandon can correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, and just from a very general stormwater um, component, uh, when you develop sites, um, you're you're required to maintain the existing runoff from the site. So uh, typically, what you see in a lot of developments is detention ponds and things like that on the site itself to be able to maintain those historic flows from the site. So we haven't considered that because we're not doing the um, site design or layout of the property. Um, we would expect some impacts, but hopefully those can be mitigated on the property with relation to whatever development happens. Yeah. Okay. Can I call a quick? You go first. Mary, Aaron. So kind of related to that, um, how would fill impact, not that fill, <laughs> F-I-L-L, um, impact the, um, the groundwater? Because there'll be different levels of fill in the 500-year floodplain for making the part of the parcel, um, the ability to develop it. I hate the word developable, so I was trying to avoid it. But um, so what What impact might that have to the groundwater? And um, how would that impact the whole um, groundwater um, mechanism for, for keeping it flowing under the dam? Because there'll be some sort of a, a passageway, right? below ground. So how, how would the groundwater be impacted by that fill? I think just uh, in, in responding to Adam's question, the most obvious impact would be um, if, you're, if you're putting fill down and you're compacting it, it may not infiltrate water at the same rate that the existing ground had. Because we're at a conceptual design level, we, we I'm not aware that we have studied those impacts in detail, and um, we would probably do so as part of a final design if you chose one of the options that had um, huge impacts from fill. And will there be um, wells to monitor that in that area to provide some insight into that? Uh, so we haven't uh, specifically focused on the fill because this is the first time we've considered fill um, in that area. So for the 200 and the 500, this is the first time we've considered those large areas of fill. But there would be wells throughout the site to manage, uh, to monitor groundwater and make sure we're maintaining the existing conditions. Um, and the groundwater conveyance system under the flood wall, th those are where we could see the biggest impacts to groundwater because those are actually designed to cut off groundwater. So our system um, would need to be designed to maintain existing conditions on either side of that. So um, yes, there would be groundwater monitoring. So Aaron, I've got you on the colloquy. Yeah. I just want to clarify from your answer to Adam's question, which is that, uh, that it, let's say that CU does develop 129 acres, that they would be legally required at the t by the time they finish development uh, for there to be no additional um, runoff impacts uh, and that it would have to impact any changes to the permeability in the site with detention and other facilities on that site. That's correct. Right. So there wouldn't be an additional runoff impact because they'd have to mitigate it. Correct. Yeah, thanks. Rachel. Okay, I have a series of questions. Um, but first, because I didn't say it earlier, that was a great presentation. Thank you both for all your work. Um, my question's on table five on page 16. I don't think you need to pull it up, but it's talking about the different footprints that the 100, 200, five-year options would have. And it says the footprint for 100 years is 64 acres. That's 10 acres of embankment, 19 excavation, 34 fill. Uh, my question, C has offered 
80 acres to do whatever we need with. Is that those 80 acres, and does that mean we have 16 left in that if we do 100 a year? I'll let Brandon answer that question. I'm sorry, I, I just need to follow along with you here. Table uh, five on page 16. Yes, uh, the estimated the project footprint. For 100 year option says yes. 64 acres. 64 acres total, yes. And so CU, and, and my understanding is from sometime in the past, CU said 80 acres, do what you want with it for flood mitigation and Correct. whatever with the rest. So what would, does that mean we have 16 leftover acres? Yes, and um, I'm just gonna go back to the maps. So as part of the conceptual analysis we did, we looked at ways to optimize the project. Mm -hmm. And one of those ways of optimizing the project was rather than using all of those acres for detention and having to convey Vili underneath our facility, we pulled the embankment back and allowed Vili Channel to remain open. Um, and so that's why we're not using those additional acres. So, um, so is there any thought to what we would do with those 16 acres? That sounds good to me that we've got 16 floating around. Yeah, that was something that um, kind of changed a little bit. Phil Kleisler with the city's planning department. Um, and that was, that was um, one of the changes in the university's annexation application resubmittal last month, which was um, committing to 80 acres for um, the flood mitigation project um, or to 80 acres for that project or to be used for open space mitigations relating to the project. Okay, so that's possibly 16 acres that we have to play with for mitigation. Awesome. Um, okay, so that's question one. Two, um, I had asked it at our earlier February meeting, um, if we do 100 rather than 500, what benefits or what protections do we get um, at the 100 year in terms of maybe flash flooding mitigation? Or I think maybe there's a, a sense of like, I hear 100 versus 500 and that's 400 more. And I don't think it's like a, a, a that the units work quite like that. So I think even in the event of a 500 year flood, the 100 year protection still gives us a lot. And so I don't know if there was an answer from our last session on that. And then maybe to T might be fill up while you're looking at that. I'd also asked about the, um, an, on an equity issue, who's in harm's way. And so that will be my next question is, what do we find out there? So Rachel, I looked up the disposal at Carter Lake. It's yeah. a little bit less than 12 acres, 11.14. Uh, so, and that was a disposal of about 12 acres? Yeah, but it was for uh, non-exclusive perpetual easements. So it wasn't for building a wall, it was an easement. For an underground pipeline? Yep. Was that related to flood mitigation? No, it was no. It's a water pipeline. Okay. Water supply pipeline. Thank you. And I believe that most of the OSMP lands, that uh, those were conservation easement lands that we held and not fee lands. Mm -hmm. so, so there were some fee lands, Dan. Uh, yeah, but the joint county up the northern one was a joint county. And so it was city. the IMLA, IM, IMO right. and mm -hmm. IBM Monarch. They said, the, the agenda memo just says that there, there's also treating the conservation easement lands differently. Yep. Thank you. It, it, it's really not apples to apples, but no. you asked the question. Thank you. So uh, back to the flood protection. So um, as I stated earlier in the presentation, um, the 500 year and the 100 year, um, there's probabilities of, happen of those happening in any given year. So the level of flood protection we go above the 100 year is actually protecting people at um, less risk, I would say, um, from a statistical standpoint, um, from a flood. And during a 500 year flood, we haven't quantified it yet because we want to wait till we figure out what the design of the facility would be, but um, you would see a benefit for the 500 year flood um, with a 100 year facility. We just haven't quantified that yet. Because we've, I would imagine we still detained a lot of the water that causes the catastrophic flooding in the event of a 500 year by, by holding it back for the 100 year level. Correct. Yes. There would be benefit. Okay. All right. So my next question was the, the one for Phil on, on who's in harm's way. So pretty recently before this meeting, we did get some mapping completed that we can share with council electronically. We wanted to review it a little bit more, but it does include critical facilities. Um, we even have jobs numbers, city, um, uh, city structures, as well as um, some other facilities that we, we thought would be of interest with your questions on, on February 4th. And we can share that with you um, tonight or tomorrow okay. early. Um, 
that's great. And I, I had just independently kind of randomly learned that I think of the people that we have placed um, in supportive housing with vouchers, there's something like 65 who are outside of the um, Lee Hill complex, and a about a third of them or a quarter of them are living um, in the nest properties that's right across from see you south. So that's just one piece of the, the puzzle that I got is that there are um, a large number of people that we are exiting from homelessness who are kind of on the front lines of, of um, that potential disaster. Okay, uh, next question. Just wanted to clarify on the levy. My understanding is that the current levy that's in place did not contribute to flooding outcomes in 2013. Didn't make that worse. Can anybody con confirm or deny that? Yes, uh, it, it only affects the uh, property adjacent to the levy, which is the CU South property. So it did limit the flooding on the CU South property itself, but it didn't negatively impact downstream users. And um, that's been something we've seen in the modeling consistent all the way back from the 2003 hydraulic study. Uh, okay. Um, so is there any particular engineering, and I know there's separate environmental concerns, but is there any engineering reason to keep that levy in place? Does it help uh, it, alter anything? It doesn't anything? affect the flood mitigation design we have in, right now. So with or without the levy, um, the flood mitigation design as proposed would still function. And, and does anybody know the cost, dif cost differential if we keep the levy in place versus take it out? So the levy removal can be done numerous ways. Um, so you don't have to remove the whole levy. You can breach certain sections of it. You can um, remove the whole levy if you would like to use the fill. We haven't considered that in our cost estimate yet because um, we don't know what that levy removal would look like. Okay, that's all I got for now. Thank you. So, can I just, so the, the cost estimates you have don't include any money for removing the levy? Yes. Okay, that thanks. Nor any possible savings Yes, or any savings from being able to use that material if we were able to use that material. So it's um, still on CU Boulder's property, so it is their material. Yeah. Okay, great. I'm going to go, <clears throat> and then we've got Mark and Bob on the stack. Um, so one thing I wanted to ask you, Dan, was about there was some previous disposal done due to the widening of US 36, right? We got rid of some fairly sensitive habitat in a disposal to accommodate that. And can you talk about how successful the, the reestablishment was? Because I know there was compensating acreage and that and there was an attempt made to bring back whatever species were impacted by the widening of 36. So how did that work out? Yeah, if I'm gonna invite Don D'Amico, who actually was one of the leads in, in that um, restoration, up here to comment on that. Don D'Amico, Open Space Mountain Parks. Um, you're right, we did work with CDOT um, when we disposed of land for, uh, I believe it was the phase one US 36 improvements. And we um, uh, worked with CDOT and the regulatory agencies to, to try to mitigate the impacts to mostly um, ladies' trusses orchid habitat. CDOT purchased a property north, just north of the East Boulder Rec Center. And um, we worked with them to develop a mitigation plan that involved grading, regrading the property. Um, we actually transplanted, this was kind of a novel idea and something that hadn't been tried before. We transplanted um, large, like I think there were about four by eight sod mats um, of, of um, soil that contained um, a variety of wetland plants, including Lady Stress's orchid. We placed them in a hydrologically, what we thought was a hydrologically suitable area on the mitigation site um, to the north of the rec center. And um, we had fairly good success um, recreating uh, the wetlands that were associated with the latest tresses orchid, but we never saw any recruitment of the actual orchid itself, um, in, including, uh, they're, they're a, a species that kind of, um, Flowers some years, they can go three or four years, even longer without flowering, and then for some reason conditions are just right in the flowers. We've been monitoring that since that time and uh, haven't seen any spare um, uh, Eulatus tresses orchid 
uh, growing in those areas. I see. And about how far was the distance that those sod mats were transported? I mean, from the, the site of the expansion to the site near the rec center, how far away was that? Mm, that's maybe um, a mile to a mile and a half. Okay, yeah. And <clears throat> so I just wanted to have that context um, about how sensitive it can be with this particular species as far as resetting it in a location that's far away. Um, have, have you had experience successfully um, doing this kind of mitigation work with the Utes, Ladies, Tresses, Orchids? No, this, that was the first attempt we had made to actually transplant the species. And I, as, as far as I know, it, it, hasn't been, it hadn't been tried before. So Let's see. Okay. Um, and then with that in mind, <clears throat> if there's going to be disturbance of habitat of that particular species, what would you think of as a way to mitigate the loss of that habitat? That's, that's the big question. Um, we've, I, th I think we, um, we tried our darndest. We, I, th I think we, we did a pretty good job. Um, replicating the soils. It was, you know, they're alluvial soils in a floodplain. The hydrology was um, suitable based on some groundwater monitoring. And um, if any, if any uh, transplant process would have, would have been successful, you know, we feel pretty confident that that would have done it. As far as um, mitigating any impacts from this project, um, I think we, you know, we could try again. We could look at um, maybe expanding the um, the area that we mitigate. Um, there might be a way to, um, instead of using, instead of uh, transplanting sod, there might be another way of transplanting um, uh, yeah, individual clumps rather than big sod mats. Um, we just we just really don't know at this point. There's no kind of next step that we're really confident would mitigate for the impacts to the, the orchid. Okay, and in the area, we had a nice map up before of the, <clears throat> the habitat. In the area, if, if these mutes lady stresses do not come back, the wall and the disturbance gets rid of them, are there other locations nearby where there are? Um, I mean, if you just go down to South Boulder Creek, are there more there, or where do you find them on the property? Uh, we find them all up and down the South Boulder Creek corridor from um, our Burke 2 property, which uh, abuts the golf course farther north, all the way down, all the way down to um, uh, about Highway 93. So all along the South Boulder Creek floodplain, um, we find them scattered. This, it's interesting that they kind of bunch up for some reason right up against the highway. The hyd hydrology must just be ideal. Um, but we find them kind of scattered around. We um, just south of the darkest um, rectangle that you see up there um, is, is open space property. And that was a formal gravel mine site also that we purchased in the mid 90s. And um, it was reclaimed by the gravel mining company by um, basically filling in the gravel pits with uh, wash vines from the processing, the gravel processing. And um, Spiranthes, the uh, Ute Ladies Tresses orchid came back there just voluntarily. So that was encouraging to see that without much kind of um, direct effort to, to transplant them or reseed them or anything like that. They, they came back on their own there. Got it. And one thing that we had received on council, I think we were doing the comp plan update, was a map It was a little different than this that had some, some circled areas. So of course, everything along South Boulder Creek, um, the wetlands is really excellent habitat. And then there was um, a bubble kind of in the middle of the levee area that called out potentially good habitat if restored. It was something along those lines. And it was just in what's actually a pretty light yellow area right now. Mm -hmm. And that ended up becoming OSO, I think, partly because of that conversation and the discussion. So have you given any thought to if we do um, breach the levee, what will happen with the now drier lands on the inside? Well, we. We think there's the potential for them to be um, 
hydrologically restored right now. This, the, um, it's hard to point out the, um, sure. Um, just inside the Letterby, you'll see a, almost a parallel, real thin brown line. Uh -huh. So that's a, uh, uh, Brandon's following it there. That's, that's a drainage ditch that um, conveys what would potentially be groundwater filling the site. Um, it conveys it through the site and into those northern ponds. So we think that if we, um, well, breaching the levee will largely help with habitat connectivity, not necessarily, we, we don't think anyway, groundwater connectivity, but um, we think we could restore the hydrology using a combination of um, uh, cutting off those drainage ditches and also potentially using um, some dry creek to water rights to kind of hydrate the site. So there's a, there's a high potential, I would say, for that area um, inside the levee, that lighter yellow area, mm -hmm. yep, right in there to be restored to a fairly high quality habitat. Great. Great, thank you. I just wanted to check that nothing had really changed from that time. Mirabai, you have, yeah. So kind of in the same line of thinking with the trusses, if you guys were to go, well, the, the construction was to go in and start um, destroying the Preble's habitat, would you be doing it at a specific time of year where, I mean, I don't know how their nests are, I'm, I, that's not my expertise, but, I mean, would you be, be, I mean, would they run away? Would you be crushing them? Would you be destroying their nests with, with babies in them? What, how is that going to work? Well, so the Fish and Wildlife Service would require that the any construction activities occur at a time when they're um, uh, not actively hibernating. Okay. So they would have potentially or theoretically opportunities to move out of the area. So they, um, I, I can't remember the exact dates, but there's a, a, a window um, where, where if it's occupied habitat and Fish and Wildlife Service gives clearance to do construction or other activities that would impact the habitat, they only allow it during a certain time of the year. So that includes like they they don't have babies and yeah. breed. Yes. I don't know if they hibernate and breed at the same time. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And I just have one last um, question to verify. I believe, Joe, when we've talked about <clears throat> how much detention volume you get in a 500 year versus a 100 year detention scheme, it's something like 1.85 times as much. So if you have X amount in a 100 year scheme, you go to a 500 year detention, so your dam gets higher and your area gets bigger, it's something on the order of 1.85 times the volume. Does that sound right? 1.6 1. I'm hearing. 1.6, okay. So I guess then kind of what that means to Rachel's question about a 100 year um, detention system during a 500 year flood is we will detain something like two thirds of the water. Correct. Okay, and so that's the level that we can expect is that it's a third as bad, a 500 year flood is, a, um, <clears throat> yeah, one third as bad as it would have been without the 100 year system in place. I was just trying to put some numbers on that. Okay, Mark and then Bob. Question on a slightly different uh, subject, um, cost estimates. Um, uh, table five has cost estimates for the 100 year at uh, 66 and for the 500 year at 93. But these are what you call class four estimates of project costs, which are, quote, appropriate for use to use for comparing alternatives, but do not typically provide reliable budgetary estimates. And I understand you can't have a reliable budgetary estimate at the moment because we're too preliminary. My question is do you have a sense of the potential delta? between this class four estimate and what it might actually cost? And if it's 66, are we looking at possibly 75 or 175? So I doubt that any of these numbers would change our commitment to providing uh, flood mitigation, but they may have consequences for the fiscal health of the city and will have other impacts that we're going to have to deal with. So Douglas Sullivan is our principal engineer in utilities and, and he's done a lot of work kind of explaining the cost estimating scenario. So I, I will turn it over to him. I will say um, I've seen a lot of cost estimates in, in my time at the city and, and sometimes they're really rough crude numbers and, and when the real project costs come out, it's like 
yeah, we were we were way off on that. We were way low. I, I think we've tried to to be as realistic as we can, and um, I, I feel good about the costs that are in the table. But I'll turn it over to. Douglas to explain the estimating. Okay, thanks Joe. Douglas Sullivan, Principal Engineer for Utilities. So the class four is one of a number of designations. The Association for American Cost Aiding Estimating Engineers has five. And five is the most rough, four is the second rough, and the way it works is the five is more of a wag, the, the level four is conceptual, the level three is preliminary design, the level four excuse me, two is final design, and, and the final one is bid documents. So there is a healthy range that is understood and expected that's associated with all of those. The class four has a negative 30 and plus 50% range. So let's use a round number like a $10 million project. You could remove three million and say seven on the low end, and you would say 15 on the high end. For most people, that's sort of an extraordinary range, but it's a reminder of what is known and what is not known at that time. So it is very typical when you go through the design process to revise your cost estimates at the 30, 60, 90, but I would remind City Council that even in the best of circumstances, it's difficult to take into the bidding climate even when you have final documents. We've had bids that have come in low, but with 100% bid documents, we have been off by 20 and 50% before, and that's our consulting engineer's best estimate. So it is conceivable that this could be a $100 million project when we get down to the bid stage? At this point, it is. Okay. I'm sorry to hear that, but thank you. <laughs> yeah, and there's one other thing to keep in mind, and that's that we're not bidding the project right now. In the capital improvements program, when we put numbers into our CIP, we use a 4% escalating factor going forward. So if you were to multiply that three or four or five years out, there would be a natural escalation associated with both labor and the cost of materials as well. And since these estimates were produced on in 2018, so we're already two years behind. Uh, the, the latest numbers are 2019, 2020. So these are present day estimates, which you're looking at on the chart today. Okay, thank you. Okay, I've got Bob and then Mary. Mark, that, Mark, that was a perfect tee up because that's exactly where I was going. <laughs> Could you put up slide 26, please, so we can continue to build on what Mark started to talk about? It's your opening act. You bet. I Thanks, Mark. <laughs> I'll, I'll, do, I'll reciprocate next time. So I th these are the numbers that Mark was referring to, and we, we I think we now understand that there's a plus or minus pretty healthy um, percentage here. But just focusing on these numbers, I, I remember very um, clearly um, sitting up where these good people are sitting up in the audience in August of 2015 when we approved option D, um, and the price tag I think then was $22 million. So here, here we are four and a half years later in many multiples of $22 million. But setting that aside, um, the money's gonna have to come from someplace, yeah. Correct. Um, and I suspect we'll issue bonds, and um, those bonds will be paid for by uh, stormwater revenues, is that a fair assumption? Some sort, some sort of water utility revenue is probably stormwater, right? Can you give us an idea? I mean, we're kind of throwing these numbers around somewhat cavalierly. Um, they're really, really big numbers. Can you give us an idea on a per million dollar basis or per $10 million basis what the effect is on stormwater rates for, um, let's say, average homeowner? I mean, are we talking, you know, per million, how many, how many cents or how many dollars per month per homeowner are we talking about? And if you don't know those numbers right now, that's fine, but I think it'd be really helpful because I don't really know the difference between 66 and 96. I mean, I know it's 30 million, but I don't know what that means to our residents. And it would be helpful to understand, are we talking a few cents per month per homeowner, or are we talking many dollars per month per homeowner for that $30 million delta? So I think we've done some of those calculations, and what I recall that we put in the memo is the range that you see up there would result in um, potential rate increases of 50 to 70 percent on the stormwater fund. And what I recall, and Douglas, correct me if I'm wrong, we kind of looked at what impacts that might have to the average residential rate payer, and it, I'm, I'm remembering 10, 12, 15 dollars per month kind of thing. Yeah, the current stormwater monthly rate for a residential customer is about $17 a month. So, so this would increase that by 50 to 
Correct. And, and typically would that be phased in over, I, I know this project won't start for a few years, but that would be phased in over a period of time or would people see, see a big 50% jump in their bills? It could be either. We, we have some ability to navigate that in our, in our six year CIP as we're sort of spacing out projects. Okay. So just, I'm going to do real quick math here. You, you indicated that, that these, these numbers are 12 to, uh, what was, the, what was the range you gave us for this, this these numbers? Six for a class four, it's considered negative 30%. No, 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 these, what, what, the, what the impact the average homeowner is between 66 and 96. So if you were to take $30 million, for example, the 30 million, the delta, yeah. You know, the delta. Yep. Okay, the general rule of thumb we use for the debt service associated yeah. with a $30 million bond is about 10%, so that would be $3 million a year for debt service. Right. A 1% increase in the stormwater utility is somewhere between 100,000 to 120. So you could safely say that delta would be approximately 30%. Now. The rates have been very good lately, so the actual rates have been closer to 8%, but from since the project would be a number of years out, we would estimate the debt service at closer to 10%. Okay, we're, we, yeah, that's, that's fine for now. Um, we're doing some real-time math here, but if you guys could send us a follow-up email or memo sure. and just maybe break these 66, 96, 93 down into what it really would be for an average homeowner on their stormwater bill over the course of the bond, which is presumably a 20 or 30 year bond. Is that a fair assumption? 20 is typical. Okay. It would just be nice to know that, you know, so if you take the baseline, what, what people are paying now, and then how much more would be pay, be, people be paying? For all you know, of the options. For, for Yeah, or, or pick the high and the low, 66, 96, just so we can understand what that delta means. We may make a decision for reasons other than economics, sure. but it would just be nice to know what that is. Yeah, we can get that back to you. Great, thanks. Can I just clarify? Um, and just when we're speaking about percent increases to the stormwater fee, that of course is just one component of someone's water bill, right? And so just so people who are maybe watching can understand like about what percent of your overall water bill is the stormwater fee? Yeah, so the, there are three components, as you said, Aaron. There is a water component, which is for the drinking water. There's a component for the wastewater, and there's a component for the stormwater. In general averages, I recall the water is around $35 a month. The wastewater is around 30 and then 17 So if that's 65 plus, you know, give or take another 20 the average is somewhere between 80 and 85 a month. Okay, so that j just to be clear that, and you can give us those numbers as well, sure. but just so people know, it's not that the entire bill would go up by 50 to 70%, but just the stormwater No, component. that component. So the 50%, right. for example, right now on $17 would be $8.50. So if we're saying it's more around like a, 85, it might go to 92. If it was 92, it would go to 100. So it's more like a 7% increase in your overall bill. Something, or you get us the numbers, yeah. Good. <clears throat> Mary? So along the same lines, um, the memo actually says that the stormwater and flood management utility rates would go up. So it by 50 to 70 percent. So is it both or just one? So that's just the complete name, Mary, for the oh, utility. Okay. There is the water, then the wastewater. When we bond for either water or wastewater, those are bonds together. The stormwater and flood management utility is just one. Okay, it has it. a long name because we differentiate between sort of the local drainage component and the major drainage way is really the flood component, but it's one utility. Okay, got it. Thank you for that clarification. Um, and then also the, the increase that we're talking about, is that for the... Um, flood mitigation piece only, or does it include the fill and the CU South impacts as well? So what Bob is asking us for is to come back with some numbers for the high and the low. So we would come back and, and remind you what the rate is for the existing residential customer, and then we would estimate what it would be for the low end at the 66 million, and then what the impact to a monthly rate would be on the 96 as well. And so what I'm asking is, is it, um, for the 66 million, or is it, in column one, is it for the 41 million, or it's for the full 66 million? And, I, and what Bob's asking, is it the 66 million, the high-low being 66 and 93? And what I'm asking is, um, are we, would the rates go up based on the total at the bottom, or is it just for the flood mitigation? It would be for the total. The total project cost, we would have to bond for that amount. The total project cost. 
Thank you. Rachel. For the um, earth fill line, 10 million to 34 million, is that um, only required in the event that the berm is taken out? Uh, not in our opinion, so I, I think you'll hear a presentation later, but the Boulder Valley uh, guiding principles, essentially it, the area protected by levee and the 500 year floodplain have the same requirements. So we would need fill in both of those scenarios to elevate an area protected by a levee or an area protected by a 500 year floodplain. Um, and then in the case of the uh, 100 year, that would be located in the inundation area and the others would be actually located in areas that we would want to switch from an OSO land designation, which has its own requirements to a pub land designation. And that's where that fill um, increases. Pretty significant. So CU has indicated that um, if we left the berm in place that we would have a, a good cost savings because we would need less fill. You're disagreeing with that? Um, I, I think it's open for discussion at this point. Um, we, we feel that the guiding principles are pretty clear that there can not be any developable or not any academic offices or structures that you would want to build on the property in an area protected by a levee or in a 500 year floodplain, which is what is we're talking about land. Okay, property. so maybe when CU comes up later, we can clarify that with them. But if, if it's a, if it really is a cost that's only associated with the berm, I would question, and, and that has implications on open space and, and usefulness and restoration, why that benefit would go on our utility bill rather than maybe be being paid for by open space funds. If it's not really related to the flood mitigation project, why would that, uh, again, that only assumes that CU's accurate, but if taking the berm out adds uh, cost and the benefit is restoration of open space, it's confusing to me why that would end up on anybody's utility bill. And if I, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. If I go first this time, Eric, um, and just, the, and, uh, with respect to Rachel's questions, I, th I think hers would apply to the 200 and 500 year events. In the 100 year, the fill area is just where there's actual inundation, right? So I think it would be, in that case, it probably was, isn't a question, but for 200 and 500 year, it's an excellent question. Is it fair? And so to clarify, we did all of the, the modeling work that um, Brandon led with the assumption that the levy was removed. And um, we felt like that was, we did that because that was consistent with the, the guiding principles and we tried to stick to that. We would not disagree with the university that there could be some implications to fill costs um, if the levy were to remain in place. And that's something that there would be trade-offs, environmental cost, and um, we haven't evaluated that in, in this round of the work that we're doing. Anyone else? I, I just wanted to follow up on um, Rachel's question about why would um, the utilities bill include that cost? And I guess my question is why would the utilities bill include the fill cost? So that's if it includes that cost, why would it include, include the other cost? Just putting that out there, we don't have to answer it, but it's I guess it's sort of rhetorical. Well, and so just the way we've thought about this in terms of that question has been in pretty broad strokes. And typically, if a project that we do uh, requires environmental mitigation or costs associated with a, a landowner to get an agreement to do the project, the, the utilities fund would, would pay for those so that the project could go forward. There's probably some analysis that could be done on that question. Um, that, that we have not done yet. So in other words, that's that's a point of negotiation? I don't know that it's a point of, a point of negotiation. It's, a, it's almost a legal analysis of what utilities would pay for. It, I suppose it could potentially be a, a point of negotiation or negotiating with ourselves of what funds are, are paying for it. Adam. Quick question about fill in general. Is, what's the breakdown of cost of fill? Is most of it the fill itself or is it transportation? Is it, do you have any, I'm just wondering for 
Yeah, so because imagine someone donates a bunch of their dirt from their backyard and yeah, all <laughs> you know, fifty thousand homes. So there are. Uh, so to answer that question, we've assumed all the fill needs to be imported to the site. Um, there are a few sources of fill on the site, not in the quantities that we're talking about. So the levy contains about 60,000 cubic yards. We're talking um, for the 500 upwards of 1.3 million cubic yards. Um, our excavation is not going to generate that volume of material. So um, if there is, we're not aware of any sources that are that close that could provide that volume of fill dirt, so that's why it's assumed to be imported. And I think um, I'll have to check, but we've been assumed it's been imported at least 50 miles. Um. And so we don't really know the transportation cost versus the fill cost itself. Uh, they're broken out in the back, um, so we, we do have a more detailed estimate, and it's broken out for the flood mitigation components and then the earth fill. And we've also made some um, different assumptions for the earth fill since it's not as um, variable as the flood mitigation. We've reduced some of those contingencies. Um, it's a little more known of what a uh, cubic yard of dirt would cost and where it would be coming from. And Got it. Thank you. Any other questions? <clears throat> okay, so here's a process question. Um, we can have a discussion now about the technical stuff we've heard and then move on into speaking about annexation, or we can wait until we've fleshed out the annexation issue with questions and then we can have a more holistic discussion. So I would ask for any input as to how we want to do that. Rachel and Bob. Okay. That is to go go first on this. Yeah, I agree with Rachel. And it, so let me turn that back into a question to staff. I mean, I think um, you're you're looking to get out of this room with some sort of indication from us. Uh, I think you're looking for us to narrow this down to either one or two options, so that we can do our our, our reviews with our boards and commissions, do some community engagement, and so that you can come back for a final decision from us in May. And so I think you're hoping that we would send you a signal on these options, right? That's so correct. I guess I'm, I'm, I'm with Rachel, as long as it's all kind of fresh in our mind, because I'm not sure that anything that we're going to talk about in annexation really affects these things. We, we could revisit if I'm wrong, but I, th I think we have lots of numbers and lots of engineering analysis, and I would agree with Rachel. Let's just see if we can pin this down now. I'm okay with that. Anyone else have objections? Makes total sense to me to decouple these. Cool. Um, <clears throat> then let's begin. Who would like to kick us off with the discussion of what we've just heard? Rachel. Why not? Um, uh, 200 and 500 years don't seem viable, so I would take them off the table. I think it would be helpful to have engagement from boards on the question of the um, levy that's in place and whether that's a um, a cost that we want to take on associated with, and also it would be helpful for me if we um, drill down on some additional questions to OSPT and community engagement, but I would, I don't see how it does us much good to engage the community on, do you want 100 versus 500 if 500 is not permittable and it's got this um, hugely negative impact on the environment and, it, and we're getting really good flood protection that is standard. So I think it would be great if we could give staff direction to go forth with 100 and, and, do, and that we start on community engagement there. For, for all the reasons that Rachel just stated, I agree that 100 year makes most sense, plus it is the most economically viable in addition to the environmental uh, sustainability and the fact that it just, from an engineering standpoint, makes the most sense. Mark and then Aaron. Yeah, I would third that. Um, I don't think that, I think Rachel is correct. There's not much point in talking about uh, possible solutions that we can't bring into reality. Um, uh, the 100 year looks like it's permittable. Uh, it provides benefits, it's more cost effective, and uh, I think that's the one we should be talking about uh, at the moment. Uh, yeah, Aaron, I'll, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll agree with that. I think Rachel summed up pretty well. I mean, we've always hoped to be able to do uh, 500 a year for a, a small marginal cost, but when we hear about the a potential lack of permittability and the in higher impacts to sensitive open space areas. I think looks like 100 year is the way to go. And of course, we really need, as we all know, to settle in on an option that we can then move to the next stage of design uh, so that we can get something constructed as soon as possible. 
Anyone else? Mary? So I agree with what's been said. Um, I would like to pursue um, analyzing that 8% additional for um, climate mitigation. Anyone else want to weigh in? <clears throat> so I guess I will. Um, <clears throat> back when we made the initial decision on cost estimates that were years old, the 500 year made a lot of sense because it was a very small delta compared to the 100 year. So that's why we ended up there because we could protect a lot more people over time and mitigate against climate change and do so at a premium that didn't seem particularly high. I think we went from the high 30s to the mid 40s. And so it was just something that seemed like best practice at the time. Um, I'll be happy to support moving forward with the 100 year because I do want to see a project get done and it sounds like there's a lot more flexibility with the 100 year and that's great. But I will point out that a bunch of the costs that we're basing our delta on are based around estimated ability to, to build. And so we don't need to go there for the guidance that we're giving on the technical, but when we have our next conversation, I'll be pointing out that there is a linkage, a coupling, as Mary said, between development, landowner interest, and the options that we have before us to move forward with. So in order to move forward, I'm going to support the 100-year um, selection, but I will do so noting that our hands are being constrained somewhat <clears throat> by the landowner on the site. Anybody else? Is that clear for staff? Oh, Adam, sorry. Yeah, just one more piece to add to that. I think there were 16 drainage ways in Boulder. This is one, and I assume there's plenty of flood mitigation to address on the 15 others besides this one as well, correct? So we're not, we're not like done with flood mitigation after this project. That, okay, so it's probably worth good. having some money to address the other ones as well. There are uh, utility staff will be returning to council for a study session on April 14th to provide an overview of the storm and flood utility and it will cover all aspects, not just the major drainage way elements, but everything else at that time. Perfect. I mean, that's a very good point. Um, when it was a smaller delta, it didn't seem like as big of an impact, but now that the deltas got really large, that's a really important point. Anyone else? All right, very good. Part one done by eight o'clock. Good start. Thank you all. That was a really good presentation. Thank you. Great information. I guess just one more bit as you're packing up. <clears throat> We will be having, just a reminder, we'll be having a um, CU South process subcommittee meeting earlier than expected. We'll do it on Thursday to work on questions for engagement with boards and commissions and the public and so on. Correct. So just for everyone who might not have known that. Um, so if the members of the public or other members of council have questions, like Rachel mentioned the, the berm as something that we might want to ask about. If people have other points about the more technical components of what we're doing, please forward them to us and we can make sure that staff hears about them. Good evening. Welcome to part two of your study session. Um, Phil Kleisler, the city's planning department. Um, what I'd like to do is to provide, um, the process committee suggested um, spending just a couple of minutes on some of the background and some of the annexation processes that we have talked, that council has talked about in the past, um, primarily for the benefit of some of the newer council members that haven't, haven't seen it yet. Then the two other pieces I was going to get into briefly would be the community benefits question, um, particularly as it relates to CU South and annexations in general, as well as questions around the planning reserve, a few considerations around that. Um, that was a topic that was brought up on at the February 4th meeting, questions around process. And so we issued a memo um, yesterday that you may or may not have seen. And so we'll, we'll, we'll give you some of the highlights of that and then turn it over to CU Boulder. 
they have a presentation that they'd like to, to, to um, they'd like to also address council. Um, I, I would say from a planning par department perspective, it would be helpful to leave this discussion with, uh, you know, a pretty solid understanding about council's expectations in terms of planning and land use analysis leading up to that May decision on the flood mitigation project. Up to this point, we've really been looking at it narrowly as what are the land use and other planning implications as a result of the different flood mitigation options. Um, I think now, as we were writing the memo, just so you know kind of what we were thinking was um, kind of in the middle of that, that's when the, the university resubmitted an annexation application that talked a bit about future housing that we'll get into today. Um, and then so we kind of switched gears a little bit, and I think that information has since evolved as well. Um, also with questions around the planning reserve, we just want to make sure that we're on the same page as council, and so um, I would just say that that would probably be our, our hope for, for this particular part of the study session. So with that, um, so as you know, the site was a gravel mining operation for many years until the university purchased it in 1996. Um, the university did submit an application to the city of Boulder for annexation in February of 2019. Um, that is a, still an active application and was amended last month in January. Um, there are no current plans for, annex for, for development on the site currently. Um, but the university has indicated some near-term um, um, uh, goals for the site, which would be annexation and furnishment of, of city utilities as needed, um, the creation of some low-impact recreational athletic fields, um, enhancing some of the trail system as well as the uh, tennis courts on the site as well. Um, a master plan for the site would still be several years down the road. I can pause for questions, I see, possibly. so. Um, Annexations in general are a legislative process to amend the boundary of a city. Um, and land in Boulder can be considered for annexation if it complies with the state annexation statutes as well as the policies of the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. Um, the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan does also include a local framework, the Area 1, 2, and 3 map, when making decisions on annexation. And this is one of the important considerations um, because this particular map has resulted in what we now know as a strong community edge, a compact community, and an urban-rural distinction that really separates the Boulder Valley from a lot of our peer cities. Um, and it's comprised of three different areas. Area one shown on the top left is generally within the city of Boulder, and that's the area that is urbanized that we provide a full suite of urban services to. Area two are areas adjacent to the city shown in gray on the top right um, that are eligible for annexation. And now areas one and two combined are what we call our service area. So when we're looking at um, a plan for our utilities, through our master planning process and so on, we'll look at those two areas combined because at some point in the future, we would anticipate serving them with urban services. Area three um, is actually separated into two different um, um, sort of um, categories. Um, the bottom left would be the area three rural preservation. That is the area in the county not eligible for annexation that the city and county have worked together for many decades to ensure um, a rural um, character and uses. And then there's the Area 3 Planning Reserve. And that was uh, brought up a couple of, week, couple of weeks ago. That's about 500 acres in North Boulder that is basically on reserve for, do, for doing detailed planning um, to accommodate uses, community interests that can't otherwise be provided and accommodated in Areas 1 and 2. And as you know, CU South at just over 300 acres um, is the largest undeveloped site um, in Area 2, eligible for annexation. Um, it really would be a portion of the city's southwest um, um, urban edge as you're leaving town. So after purchasing the site in 1996, the university did approach the city several times with interest in looking at the land uses on the site, really to accommodate a long-term need for the university of, of future development. Um, we deferred those conversations until a plan for flood mitigation was completed. In 2015, that was when the plan was completed, and so in 2016, we approached the university and began the discussion of examining the land uses on the site as part of the major update to the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. It was a pretty in-depth public process, and one of the things that we heard throughout that was 
um, a need for greater certainty about what might happen on the site. And so with that, we developed um, something unique, the guiding principles, um, and incorporated that into a chapter of the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. And that is intended to guide future annexation agreements or multiple agreements between the city and the university for use of the site. Um, and with that, it took a map-based approach, looking at different areas of the site and what, we'd an what we would anticipate happening in those particular areas. One of those sites, as Brandon mentioned, is 65 acres of land designated parks, urban other. And that's where, that was that initial preferred option, option D concept. That was the footprint generally of, of that option. Um, and where, what we would anticipate there being um, primarily flood mitigation, um, as well as the um, recreational activities where appropriate. And so in areas that are perhaps less ecologically sensitive, as well as conserving and restoring areas with higher ecological value. We also um, preserved 118 acres of land designated as open space other, um, and that is land in the, in the comprehensive plan in the Boulder Valley that um, was designated prior to 1981 that the city and county have had an interest in preserving in some form. Um, and so that actually broke it out into two different distinctions, one being the area outside the levee adjacent to city open space being a bit more sensitive and to minimize disturbance in that area, and then at looking at the area inside the levee as potentially um, opening up to some, uh, some lim very limited uses and restoration compensatory mitigation. Um, and then finally, the 139 acres that was remaining was um, um, designated public in the comprehensive plan, and that's what you would consider as like the development tract for the, for the site. Um, that's where the university would, would, would seek to develop. It's, it's pr predominantly housing um, and then some small-scale academic facilities, small-scale being relative to the buildings out on the east campus, really. This was one of the pieces that we discussed with council a little while ago, and I won't read this and don't expect everyone to read this, but we wanted to show this. You talked actually in this room a bit about this annexation purpose statement, and the thing that stuck out at me at the time was that there was a special emphasis given to engaging city boards as well as city council during public meetings um, in the spirit of transparency. And so this is a purpose statement for the annexation that council has talked about. This can be amended really at any time. It's not an official, official document. Um, and then the last piece on the background before going into the other two topics would be um, the schedule that we've talked about in the past. And so council has recognized that this is a high priority project um, and has indicated that it's a desire to have a more enhanced public process with the annexation. What we are, we are in that kind of grade box area talking about flood, flood mitigation options and potential land use implications. Our, our approach to this so far has been to support our colleagues in the planning's approach to in choosing a flood mitigation option in that May timeframe, um, because once that option is chosen, a lot of the other pieces are able to be resolved. So transportation, we'll know how much land is in play for open space and so on. The concept that council was interested in pursuing would be for the university and the city to negotiate a preferred path forward um, and bring that to city boards. And so this would be following the May decision. But we would then bring that input to the city council study session, have an engagement window, and present a path forward for the annexation, not necessarily all of the legal documents, but a path forward um, for a public hearing with council. Once we got that direction, it's at that point we would have the final public hearings. Um, for annexation of the land. <clears throat> that middle row is the row that's extra in the annexation process that we've talked about in the past. Again, this is something that we've worked with the process committee in the past to look at council as well. This can be amended really at any time by action um, you know, from council. Uh, just on, the, on that middle, so where are we right now? We're in that gray box, right? Yes. So the city board's input would be coming between now and May. But you're saying that would also be after May. So are you saying we would get engagement right now from boards and the public and then have our May decision and then also get more input and study session and engagement? I can see how that's confusing. You know, <laughs> uh, I was thinking the gray box is May. Um, and then I really once if we have a flood mitigation option in place and we're able to conduct transportation studies, negotiate open space conveyance, all of those other issues, we would then be able to ideally have a path forward for annexation that would say, 
this is how all the puzzle pieces fit together, and that's what we would bring through that middle line. And, and what would the timing look like? Because there's separate engagement right now coming up between now and May, and board's input, so that's a separate, there's kind of like a middle, middle row maybe, mm -hmm. right, between, between, I guess, before the gray? Yep. So then that's May, and then when is the city board's, when is the study session, community engagement, what, what do you visualize for that timeline? This has been hard to plan uh, with the annexation. Um, I would say it would be ideal. I would personally, as the case manager for the annexation application, prefer that most of that happen in 2020 um, and we move into 2021. But again, depending on what the direction we get in May kind of will, will, will you know, influence that. But, but at least a month for each of those steps, at least a month or two. So just following up, <clears throat> you talked about a host of things, transportation, studies, you talked about um, open space transfer agreements, whatever those are going to look like, and the um, actual formal legal annexation documents. How long do you anticipate those will take to produce? The transportation study, we've already basically have, have talked about what the scope of, of that would look like, and so that as well as some of the other, we've been trying to work on some of these components to at least prime the pump to be ready to have discussions with the university um, as soon as possible, but um, probably a quarter, three months to do the transportation analysis. And we have representatives from a transportation department here that can correct me. We'd also would be negotiating the open space conveyance, um, um, negotiating the development restrictions that we can get into in a little bit if you'd like, um, and then a, a suite of other potential issues. but. Overall, that's at least a half, probably a half year to get through that um, and, and then start bringing it through boards into a council study session. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so you said transportation study, open space conveyance, development restrictions, and then are there others? Um, so here's a list of, of some of the, the high points, and, and some of these will be easier than others. And so two. Two big things happened in the first quarter of 2019. Um, the university submitted their application, and that was at staff's request um, framed around the guiding principles. Um, that was also the time where we moved forward with the um, variant one 500 year option. And so we responded to that um, in March of last year through the lens of there's um, some um, a couple of issues that we need to resolve relating to inundation of the public land, which um, was talked about earlier today. Um, and so with that, we did, we've been focusing on that for the last six months with our colleagues in utilities. But yes, the term sheet that's included right now in the application is 30 some odd pages long. Um, and it includes a lot of different things, many of which I think we can we can um, come to an agreement on. We pulled out the top six issues, and that's those are those there, land for recreation, development, open space, a concept of a, a payment in lieu of taxes, um, transportation analysis, and then a potential joint public safety facility that would house um, um, city fire personnel and, and university public safety personnel on the site. Those are the six things that we pulled out as probably needing the most work. I can keep going and, and wrap up. So, um, and again, this was the area that, of inundation that we were talking about, which, which may not need further discussion this evening. And with that, um, we did um, proposed at least starting to explore a few different options um, really to address the land inundated by the flood mitigation project. Those options didn't really, we can get into these details, but given the time, I'll, I'll, I'll move forward. Um, we didn't see the three as a viable, necessarily a viable path forward, um, and so we didn't pursue them more since, um, since that submittal last year. Um, and then leading into 2019, we heard from the university that there may be some questions around future housing on the site. Um, that was formalized in January uh, last month, um, particularly around whether or not the design of the flood mitigation project would impact their ability to provide student housing and faculty housing. Um, and as such, the university has more comments on that that they will be getting into in just a moment. Um, what we did want to talk about was particularly the annexation policy. 
Um, in Boulder, we have an annexation policy in the comprehensive plan. One of, one of the bullets of it is basically it says, we will only annex area two properties with significant development potential if it provides a unique opportunity um, and it uniquely benefits the community. Uh, some of those benefits include um, permanently affordable housing, but it also includes things like um, environmental preservation, um, um, public uses such as flood mitigation. And so we um, wanted to at least remind council some of the other things that are still on the table in terms of a community benefits package, whether that be housing, flood mitigation, land, development limitations such as building height, neighborhood compatibility, view, sh view shed protection, and so on. And then the, we come to the planning reserve. So in, on February 4, there was some questions from council around process steps to move forward with the planning reserve. We, we provided, um, we took a, a dive into that and we, we summarized the process as well as some of the key issues that we were able to um, unravel over the last week and a half or so relating to that topic. Um, just a few facts about the planning reserve. Um, it's really an interim classification um, at, for a, a council to decide whether or not this land should be put into area three rural preservation or whether or not it should be incorporated into the service area and be an urbanized area of the city. The city of Boulder owns, the total acreage is just under 500 acres. The city of Boulder owns, um, parcel A was purchased by the housing division at roughly 30 acres. Um, and then um, 190 acres within the planning reserve were purchased with funds from the 0.25 sales and use tax and bonding measure approved by the voters in, uh, 1995. Um, and there's really, the memo described um, the three steps um, of the process that we would have to go through. And really it's the, um, um, can we do it? Can we provide services? And that's a baseline urban services study. That's looking at um, uh, inventory of all the services that we could provide. And these are the process steps outlined in the memo. And then there's the what. So what's the unmet need that can't be accommodated in areas one and two that we would like to accommodate at the planning reserve? That is an unmet need study. Um, and then after that is completed, um, council could then decide whether or not we need move forward with a service area expansion plan. And that's really the how. So we've identified we can serve the area, what's the, you, what's the unmet need, that's the what, and then the service area expansion plan, which is a roughly equivalent to an area plan process would d determine how we do that with development phasing, land use infrastructure plans, and so on. The memo, when we started to chart that out a bit more um, with a potential option of extending the current midterm update, that put us out until about, uh, about 2022. Um, and again, this is something we have not done before, so there's not really precedent for it. And to just show our thinking, we included that month by month estimate in the, in the memo, just just to show you, those are very much approximate. Um, and so wanted to say that as well. Um, a couple of key issues we identified would be the timing of development plans. And so that service area expansion plan, we, we would probably need uh, land use and infrastructure plans to move forward with that. That's not something the university will have for quite some time. There's some um, issues around disposal um, with par parks and, and recreation uses on the land. Um, there's our established process so these steps really need to happen in a midterm or a major update to the comprehensive plan. And so what we could do is extend a midterm update of the comprehensive plan or approach the county about amending our IGA as well. And then there's the unknown. So again, we don't know what we don't know and there's studies that could unearth things that we don't necessarily anticipate right now. Um, and it could add different factors into the mix, um, um, particularly as you're talking about parks land. And so that concludes my presentation. What we could do is to break for questions if anyone, if any council members have any, or we can um, um, segue into um, university representatives. They also wanted to address council this evening. I'd propose we do university representatives and then have our questions yeah, and discussion. Question. Okay, go ahead. Phil, could you go back to slide 29? Uh, 59, sorry. <clears throat> so Joe, um, so I think Phil did a good job in the memo of, of kind of giving us the detail and why. I'm sorry? No, I have a question. I'm just raising my hand. Okay, okay. Yeah. all right, great. So slide 59, I think summarizes <clears throat> what you put in greater detail, sorry. Phil, in those. Yeah, that one. Um, so if we <clears throat> did the super accelerated, kind of deviated from our process, 
and um, kept the midterm update open. Theor hypothetically, we could get to an annexation decision by 2022. If we didn't, um, we could get to an annexation decision by 2027. And you laid out in the memo the, all the steps to get there, so we don't have to go into those. But this is a question really for you, Joe. At what point in time is there a point of convergence for you where it matters whether CU is building at CU South or not? I mean, uh, it sounds like right now it doesn't matter because you're planning, you're doing flood design work and it kind of doesn't matter if they're building on that little western bit or not. <clears throat> and we've kind of narrowed it on 100 years so you kind of know what the fill potential is um, or fill needs are. are. At what, what point in time, if you continue a pace, do you think it's gonna matter to you whether CU builds on CU South or does something different from an engineering standpoint? So when we were talking uh, earlier about the, the challenges of the project and we went through all the permitting agencies and I mentioned the land use components of it, probably the, the biggest one for the flood mitigation to proceed and going back to my initial remarks, we don't own the property. Mm -hmm. And so we need an agreement uh, and the, the CU has offered to donate 80 acres for our use, which we appreciate, but ultimately, the annexation piece has to get settled for us to, to move forward. And later on, when we get to the end of the presentation, um, talking about engagement and process going forward, I, I want to talk to you about building in some checkpoints to answer that very question, sure. because there's we continue to move forward with this annexation and, and land use thing looming over the project, and there's just uncertainty associated with that. So possibly a conversation for the process subcommittee of can we build in checkpoints where at specific milestones we all check in and say are we making progress on the annexation should we keep going with the flood design or do we is it all coming together so I'm not answering your question yeah, you're not like when <laughs> just, so I'm gonna try it again when yeah well I, I get the fact that we need the landowners consent yeah. To, to, to do to actually move dirt so I get I get that and and so just just um, bear with me assuming that the landowner is not saying no landowner is saying well yes subject to some conditions what, what I'm really trying to get into is is when let's say the landowner said yes no matter what regardless of whether they built there or not they were said you know what you guys can do this yeah. but we haven't we the landowner haven't decided is where were they going to build on the western portion, this 129 acres in the western portion we've been talking about. We haven't decided that yet, but don't worry about that because that's our decision. At what point in time will their decision about building or not building on those 129 acres affect your engineering, assuming you have landowner approval? I'm trying to think about how to answer that. So we can proceed right now without delay and a lot of the the costs associated with providing the 129 acres are really independent, completely independent from um, our flood design. There is some connection to environmental trade-offs, the, the levy being there or not, are we doing the fill or not? And those topics are gonna be of real interest to the open space staff and board and so getting some certainty before we do a disposal there w would be good, but we can really proceed with our flood design, I believe, without delay now. And when, so I'm just gonna try one more time because I'm also interested in this. <clears throat> when, because you described a permitting process that we have to go mm -hmm. through <clears throat> with the feds, um, which includes FEMA, and the Fish and Wildlife Service, so there's an intersection with the open space comment that you made, and with the Corps of Engineers. And so, can you start those permitting processes be, without knowing what CU will do? Most of them, yes. Some of the environmental ones where the fill would uh, affect impacts in, in area, we would need certainty on those components of it before, I believe, before those environmental permits could go forward. So that would include what's going to happen with the levy, presumably, as okay. well as what your fill is going to be like. Yeah. And so when would you anticipate being able to make those applications, that, that particular environmental application? Yeah, I'm trying to remember Brandon's timeline slide of, of when we're um, 
when we're starting the, the permitting process. What, what year was that? A year from May. A year from now. Mm -hmm. So a year from now, if we didn't have a resolution on landowner issues, we could run into a, a place where we're causing delay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for helping me answer that question. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> so I have Mary Mirabai and Rachel on the stack. Towards the end of the presentation, you said that we could do one of two things. We could extend um, the <coughs> midterm update or we could amend the IGA. Could you talk a little bit about the pluses and minuses of doing one or the other? Sure, and, and so council can authorize staff to do that first step, the baseline urban services study, really any time. Um, and that was actually talked about, I believe, pretty recently of maybe 2021 and tw or 2022, and then we'd be going into the 2025 major update of the comp plan and, and look at the entire planning reserve. Um, that can be done really at any time. So it's those next steps around un the next two, two studies um, that, we that would need to take place, particularly the service area expansion plan during one of those two updates. And so right now we saw it as, well, we'd have to wait until 2025 to do that. And so that really pushes it out then a couple more years to 27. Another option once we left the February 4th meeting was we are in a midterm update right now. And so we're at the beginning of it. So technically speaking, we could, council could choose to extend that midterm update um, to encompass these things, though it would probably hold up everything else that would be approved in that midterm update. And so that's a, that's a negative. Um, we would also, you know, want to make sure that we're bringing the Cap Boulder County along with us um, and we're consulting with them um, in this process because they will have an approval role at the end of this, at the end of that process as well. If, does that start to answer? Yeah, that gave me a, um, a minus on the extending the midterm. Um, I, I didn't hear anything about the renegotiating the IGA. Oh. So you could approach the county again about amending the IGA that says you can only do it in a midterm or major update. You know, you could make the IGA, which implements the comp plan, say anything you would like to, but however, I would, you know, talking to others who were, were managing the process last time to amend the IGA, it took several years, and so it was a pretty, pretty big lift, I think, during the last amendment. Um, and so I think that's a, I don't think that's an option to move expeditiously. Okay. Thank you. So towards the end of your presentation, you were talking about, again, what it would take um, to use that planning reserve. And one of the items you talked about was um, that Parks and Rec would have to vote to, would it be dispose of or give us the land? Um, but because also around the, I mean, from the packet, you know, I read about the charter issues and that because it was voted in with the, the tax, we'd ha just have to follow along with the charter rules. So between the board and the charter, I mean, is this going to be a really difficult process if we, if that was the route that was chosen to go and use that land as a swap? We've looked at this so far as kind of the Venn diagram of like the city and CU and CDOT and others kind of trying to meet in the middle, and that definitely throws some more bubbles into the Venn diagram of trying to, tend. and so I don't see a scenario where it makes it easier. Um, okay. And so it would, yeah, it would require majority vote by the um, um, Parks and Rec Advisory um, Board, um, as well as a recommendation by Planning Commission Council Action to do the disposal. But there would be other questions that would then come into play around the city's long-term interest in parks and recreation uses, particularly like, are we now, is that now something that we need to re-examine on CU South if we're swapping the land? Is that going to be a regional? And so these. There will be a lot of offshoot conversations that will probably happen from that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So my my first question kind of dovetails with Mirabai's. Um, when I know we're not, <laughs> I think I might drop dead by saying these two words, Hogan Pancast. <laughs> I don't know will I be struck or not. I was in the room when when that was 
uh, decided, and, and I think there was talk of the zombie has been killed because we turned it into parks and rec land. So I do wonder how steep is the ask for disposal of parks land? Because it sounded when, when Hogan Pancast was decided that that was a, a like high bar and we weren't gonna overcome that pretty easily if anybody ever wanted to do something different there. So that's my first question. And then second, um, Bob said something about, so 2022 we're, you know, we're at, are done with annexation. And I just wanted to clarify, I read that as we're just getting to the start of where we could, and back it up, 2022 seems very ambitious to me for this plan, so I don't, I, I, I'm, I'm suspicious of whether we can really do this on this expedited basis. Like I've got a lot of people who are, who, who are reaching out to me today when they realize this was on the table, like that live in North Boulder and, and are furious that we would be looking at fast tracking this. So I can't imagine we're able to minimize public input and we've got an extra body. So it's gonna be, I think, five body review if we count parks and recs. So um, even if we get to that 2022 ambitious date, that's just starting the annexation discussion, right? That's where we are now with CU South. We're there in 2022. Yeah, I'd love to comment. So the first piece, and we have members of Parks and Recreation here as well, but I think the easy answer to that is that it, it, um, it would be a high bar. Um, it's been in the Parks and Rec Master Plan as a long-term strategic holding for them um, and um, for their long-term needs. Um, and they can elaborate on that if, if they would like to. The second piece being that, yeah, there's other things that are not included in here that still would need to take place. Um, and so that would be um, the annex negotiating the annexation agreement. That would be the, the annexation process itself. And see you, that's just when they would start looking at the property, right? Is 2022. So, it, and just tying that together, like I think I heard Joe say, a year is when we need a, a decision. And if we're looking at 2022, the early CU is going to look at it. And then we're adding an extra body of review. And 2022 is probably optimistic. I just want to make sure we're all dealing in, in the world of reality here. That's also how I read the, the materials that, that the university um, will, would present this evening. Um, yes. What else? <clears throat> so, Adam. Just a quick question about the area itself, Plan Reserve. Is there any critical habitat for anything there? There's a lot of prairie dogs. Um, and, oh. um, but it was largely, so the planning reserve was chosen in the 90s after a comprehensive analysis of all that th area three land. They were getting some development proposals in to develop some of it. And so this was chosen as really the only spot in area three that was suitable for development. And one of those reasons was um, it was high and dry. It was, um, there were fewer natural um, and environmental constraints as other areas of, of area three. Oh. Aaron. So apologies if this just got asked, I had to step out for a minute. <clears throat> so I noticed in the 2022 timeframe, it included the baseline urban services study being done in 2020 and adopted in Q1 2021. So is that what I'm seeing in the memo? Yep, and, and I wanna emphasize those are rough, pretty rough estimates. What we did was we tried to outline all the steps and estimate just how many months that would take and just to give a ballpark. Right, but just uh, my understanding was that at our retreat that we just did, we specifically didn't put um, the baseline urban services study on the 2020 work plan. So I was just confused that that timeline was assuming it was done in 2020, but we had just decided not to. Yep, council can do it any time. I think the other, the previous conversation was, are we looking at the entire planning reserve? And I think this analysis was, are we looking at specific land to um, to do the uh, a negotiated land swap with the university? And so you can look at the whole planning reserve or just a portion of it. And so this anticipates just a portion. Got it. Although um, my understanding is we would have to do more than just the city owned land, right? Because there's that one six contiguity. So you'd have to include at least some other land. We would have to include, yeah, there's a property adjacent that we would have to, or some property that we would have to approach to include. Yep, thanks. Rachel. It looks like maybe the parks and rec person, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. I feel bad about that, Jeff, I'm told. Yeah. I could shed some light on that other question. So the related to the timing of the Parks and Rec Advisory Board uh, disposal process or? How that works, how steep of a hill that is to climb because we, right now we don't have Parks and Recs needing to weigh in or dispose if we just stay at CU South and don't look at a land swap. So right. we're adding a new layer to this 
issue and I'm wondering how, how big of a layer it is. Yeah, so I'm Jeff Haley, the Planning Design Engagement Manager for Parks and Rec. Um, so in terms of the process overall, as Phil mentioned, uh, the Parks and Rec Advisory Board would have to vote in favor of the disposal um, disposition of the property, and then that would go to Planning Board and then ultimately to Council. Um, you know, it, similar to as Phil mentioned, that there's not a lot of information as to what the intended use of the property was and, and other than just a reserve of property for us to use for future parks and rec needs. Um, there was a lot of information about um, ball fields and indoor recreation facilities, even cultural programs and that sort of thing. So I think in terms of our parks and rec board to really understand the, the property and to dispose of that, um, they'd want to understand are those needs not being met um, or could they be met in other places throughout the city. Um, to really be comfortable in disposing of the property, or if there was a consideration of a land swap, is there another place that that could be, such as the, the CU South property, that those amenities could be located on those, um, within those lands as well. And would, would there be, if we, if you just gave us the land and disposed of it, um, I think it would be, I don't know, 160 acres we're looking at. Roughly, um, would we owe, would the city owe money for that or would there be an expectation as with open space disposal that you'd be made whole with other land or, or things like that? Yeah, I, th I think with the 0.25 cent sales tax that was used for the intended use was parks and recreation purposes, there would probably be um, reimbursement of some kind for the, the funding that was used to purchase the property. Um, and perhaps David Gear could speak more to that. But the other thing would be just the land swap as well as understanding if that like for like goes into account, you know, we, we would have to research all of that. But the, the funding that was used initially through the bond or the 0.25 cent sales tax and then ultimately the bond was for the parks and rec purposes. Mm -hmm. Mark? Would, if, if the CU South property, and I'm not suggesting we would go this direction, but if we did a land swap for the planning reserve property, would you not, in effect, be made whole or substantially whole with the property we're acquiring at CU South if we made it available for parks? Generally, yes. Um, and that's when I went back and read through all the memos um, and information of when this property, when the planning reserve was purchased, um, at the end of the day, it's just acreage that the, the parks department has set aside to, for future needs. So. Um, in terms of working with our advisory board and others, as long as we could demonstrate here are the needs that we feel the community has now for parks and rec purposes, and that those could be identified and um, improved upon the CU property, um, that could be made whole, so to speak. Okay. Um, so whether it's at the planning reserve, CU South, at the end of the day, if there's ball fields, rec facilities, pools, there's even talk of another golf course back in the, in the 90s, so. <laughs> Wherever that falls would be kind of the intention, I think. Okay, thanks. Um, Aaron, and then Bob, and then Rachel. But, I mean, isn't there a major geographical component, though? I mean, if you're, if you're reserving land for a future park in North Boulder, swapping out for lands in South Boulder, park lands that are basically as far away as you can get and still be on the city edge, it seems like you're taking, you're shifting things away. I've, from people who live up at that north edge of town, shifting amenities away from them, right? So it's not a one, and of course it'd be great for people near the new fields, but uh, sure. you know, you'd have to do an analysis, wouldn't you, of where that need is in the town? True, uh, we'd wanna look at the, uh, just kind of the regional context of transportation, access, location, that sort of thing. And the initial um, discussions back in the 90s when this process was going forward, the intention was more of just having a large expanse of contiguous acreage to have a, light, a, a city park um, type of classification. So um, certainly we would, look at, we would wanna look at uh, proximity to future residential areas, perhaps the gun barrel community and other northern parts of the city and the region and how that would come into effect. Um, but in terms of just having property of where these types of facilities could be built, um, you know, we could consider the CU South property just for in terms of what those needs would be. Um, so Bob's and then Rachel. Jeff, I remember <clears throat> back in 2009 when I was in the Parks Board and you were in the Parks Department, we had lots of discussions about what we could do with <clears throat> this 160 acres way out 
uh, at the edge of town. And um, back then, 11 years ago, we didn't have anywhere close to any money to develop it. And I assume that now, 11 years later in 2020, we don't have any money close to doing anything with it, right? There's no immediate plans or immediate funds to do anything with that. Is that right? That's correct. As a matter of fact, and we, and we have we have other parks priorities that are actually are in queue and are in our CIP that we would probably develop first before we develop this. So if we had another 10 or 20 million dollars, this is probably not where it would go. It would go to Valmont or some of our other um, parks needs. Is that a fair assumption? Yes, that's correct. So within our six year CIP, area three is nowhere within that. It's not mentioned within our current capital investment strategy. Uh, really, the only mention Area 3 has within any of our planning documents is within our master plan as a vision level category of funding if and when ultimate dollars were realized to just even start a conceptual planning process of what might go there. So. That's a sore subject. Don't go there. Yeah. Rachel. To Bob's point, though, it would it would stay green space up north if, north if we didn't put CU south there. That land would never be developed for housing, it's parks and, and green space. And so I think we're gonna get major community objection to losing that land up north. Um, but also, if I'm following correctly now, we are, and I'm not sure why we're looking at a land swap in the first place, so as this conversation goes forward, maybe that'll be apparent to me. But we're now talking about doing a land swap, kind of just to maybe preserve it for open space, and then we're gonna give another land swap for parks and recs and add another body of review that's not necessarily going to approve. I don't understand why we'd be looking at two land swaps at this point in the 11th hour of this project. Okay, shall we, uh, do we have more questions? Um, if not, then maybe we should have CU come. And, and I have questions for parks, but I'll wait till after we've heard from CU. Thanks. Well, hi, everybody. <laughs> Thank you for inviting us to come today and asking us to present. So I'm Francis Draper, and this is Derek Silva, representing the University of Colorado Boulder today. I can. Is that a little better? Okay. So um, we wanted to go through a fairly quick presentation with you all, and then um, I think give you some opportunity to ask us some questions and on all of these various topics that you've been covering so far. So what we're gonna talk about is just what has been the recent process. The annexation community benefits very similar to what Phil showed you, so that won't take long. What were the annexation requirements that we stated previously? Why 129 acres, a little bit of that has been covered, but we'll address that further. And then recent updates, um, what we see is some of the issues, some of the circulating misconceptions we think are out there, and then just a quick conclusion. So recent process, first of all, I think we should give ourselves a high five as a team. Um, you know, we, we are working together, I think, to um, achieve a higher common goal. We want to address safety in the community, and the county, the city, and the university with community input all did a pretty fabulous job of doing that through the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Planning Process over two years, and that was a major achievement. So I think we could give ourselves a round of high fives on that. Um, we all came to the table in the spirit of compromise to achieve flood control while balancing there are many community priorities, as we all know, um, with the obligation that the university has to meet its mission and the city to provide life and safety. So I think it, it's been a good convergence there. And I have to say the staff put in some extraordinary dedication time and energy to consider the many alternatives that came at them over the years for flood control at the request of council and the community as a whole. So all of those, I think, are something that has really moved the process along, and I think this council and the immediately prior council can take a lot of personal credit for that. So just to talk a little about um, annexation of community benefits, just to reiterate, I think Phil covered a lot of this, 80 acres, and we did 
communicate to the city last year that it no longer relied on the use of those acres for actual flood mitigation, but that we would provide that 80 to be used however you saw fit. So I think that really addresses, um, I think something that Rachel brought up, if in that um, 100 year that you are leaning towards, you use, I think it was 64 acres, is that correct, Phil? Um, that leaves you 16 to use towards that open space um, mitigation. And I might point out that, that that rectangle at the bottom of the um, outline of our property is a federally designated wetland immediately adjacent to open space. So that might be a great place to start. Um, future housing um, would be designed to be compact and clustered village style. We're not subject to the city's height limit, but we agreed to comply with that in this space. Um, we are going to work to um, protect and complement the views. Um, we would prioritize housing for faculty, staff, and upper division students, and we'll talk about our update. No large sports venues, provide connections to trails, and welcome the community to continue walk, run, cross-country ski. Um, seek opportunities to protect the scenic and natural value. Make the recreational fields available to community partners. Create a multimodal hub, which we'd have to work on with the city, depending on how the development works out. And then provide a 60-day review for the city on any future site development up from 45. So I'll turn this over to Derek to talk about what our requirements were initially. Uh, thank you, Council. Um, so these are our key annexation requirements as they appear in our application. Uh, the first is 129 acres uh, for potential future development. Uh, the second is the ability to connect to city utilities, and that's what results from annexation. And we want to note here that um, we will cover our own infrastructure costs, including utilities, roads, multi-use paths, et cetera. Uh, and there's a couple of exceptions to that, but generally uh, the utilities exist at the boundaries of the site and we will be responsible for the cost for connecting to those and uh, bringing those utilities to our development locations. Uh, the city will cover the increased costs due to displacement of access roads, warehouse, tennis courts, et cetera, by the flood structure. And those are incremental costs that are determined by the displacement of those structures and the road by the flood mitigation structure. Uh, if the city removes the levy, the remove, the, that removal shall not increase the FEMA 100-year or 500-year floodplain on the property. And then an additional 30 acres for recreation fields, which can be located in the detention or OSO areas. As well from, so the 129 acres, um, there's been question about why 129 acres that we've heard uh, asked throughout this process. And it, this resulted from the negotiated outcome between CU Boulder and the four voting bodies of the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. Uh, the 129 acres is the area de designated as public and was identified for future development for CU Boulder in the BVCP. And then that entire 129 acres exists outside of the 500-year floodplain. So that is that is a relatively unregulated floodplain here in Boulder, as most of you know, uh, save critical facilities. And th this 129 acres represents less than 50% of the 308 acres composing the property. And uh, th our ability to develop this, uh, this minority area of the site is going to allow us to continue to meet our mission as a state's flagship research institution. So where we are in the where we are in the discussions recently with the city is we've come back and had some discussions about what would it take for the university to recommit to housing as its predominant use um, of the area to be developed on the property because as Phil showed you, we updated that annexation application to say we would have to pause and consider depending on how the development of the flood mitigation actually shaped up to see if it was an appropriate place for housing. Um, and then the second question was whether the university would consider swapping C. Boulder's South property for city-owned land in that planning reserve area three you were just discussing. So as far as housing goes, we believe, we've, uh, we've talked to a number of people at the university and our leadership that we can continue to commit that that is the predominant use of the site for housing if the city can agree to allow multiple entries into the property. So in other words, we don't have a community that's been developed behind the dam with one single access road coming over the dam. 
Um, but if we can create multiple entries, then we think we've got a more open neighborhood. And we're thinking Highway 93 is a easy one, and then maybe there are some adjacent neighborhood things. So nothing is a predominantly used, and I think that was a lot of the concern of the local communities. We don't want a stream of traffic flowing through our neighborhood. But if there are three or four entrances and exits from that property, now it's much more accessible um, into the rest of the community. Okay, so now we're getting into the, the swap for city land, which is a continuation of uh, where Phil left off and the discussion left off before we came up. So we have concerns about the proposal, and it's likely to create substantial delays in the flood mitigation project. And as far as we know, it doesn't produce any benefits for the flood mitigation. And it seems like it's responsible to community pressures regarding any development of CU South. And we just cannot recommend this course of action. Uh, the, the reasons are multiple, but primarily the reason is that there is so much uncertainty as to what can occur in this process. Even getting to the, to the, to the, pro, to the point where we can get it to go from area three to area two is uncertain. And then beyond that, our feasibility studies on the site are not guaranteed to produce an outcome where we think the site is feasible for a trade. Uh, due to the fact that the city's property north of Boulder is not eligible today for annexation and the significant level of resources and time required, we would only agree to begin evaluation of the feasibility of a land swap if and when the city can complete that shift from area three to area two, making it eligible for annexation, and agree that annexation of the property would occur concurrent with any swap of CU Southland. And here's some issues. This is going back to the CU South site. Uh, so with the cost for fill, uh, there are higher costs as we've already seen, and this feels like a, a re repetition of the discussion we already had earlier. Um, so I'll uh, kind of mow through this one, but uh, really we all know that with 200 and 500, there's additional fill to uh, create the 129 developable acres. Uh, and that's if the levy is removed. Uh, if the levy's not removed, those costs drop by millions of dollars. Um, the trade-offs are, as has been discussed earlier, is there's less opp opportunity to do reclamation in OSO. Um, but an opportunity that could exist for keeping the levy is that there's more opportunity for the community to continue to enjoy walking, running, walking their dogs, cross-country skiing, et cetera, on the levy. Um, so some of the circulating misconceptions we wanted to address is and I think those have been brought up previously that the university is forcing the city into huge costs to maintain that 129 acres. So we view this as a choice the city has to take the levy down for more restoration opportunities and pay more for that fill or maintain the levy, which the university would do at its cost and drop the cost significantly. Um, and then this issue that you seem to have already resolved um, at a hundred year, there's very, I would say, no additional fill. I think we can talk with that, about that with Brandon, but there's limited fill in that case. Um, and then this issue that the levy on the property caused more flooding in 2013, and I think Rachel already addressed that with staff. One of the other issues is the city um, should just condemn the property. And I think the key issues here are the city has a willing partner in the university with land not only offered at market rate, but actually for free. Um, and that we are well on the path to finding a solution that helps both governmental entities achieve their missions. So I think we're pretty far along in this annexation process. We have a very comprehensive application in front of the city. The staff has already respond to, uh, responded to us. Some of the issues that Phil put up as the top six, we've already responded to. Um, so we're moving right along, and I think Phil addressed that we have many areas that are green, and we have come to agreement, or we're close to agreement. So there are really some of these large issues, and we're ready to rock and roll um, on this. Um, the other thing that often comes up is the property floods. It's not suitable for any development. Um, and as we noted, that the public area is fully out of the flood zone that public area, and that's why it was designated as the development area in the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. Most of the area marked as OSO is in the 500-year floodplain, um, so it wasn't affected in 2013, and that is within inside the levy. Yes, so to conclude, uh, we re remain committed to bringing this project to a successful conclusion. I think both sides have put a lot of work into achieving and an 
an end where we could solve this on this this one site without having to go to another site. Um, so we look forward to continuing to work with you guys to try and solve this problem and get flood mitigation to our community. Yeah. First of all, thanks to both of you for coming tonight and for that presentation. It's very helpful. Um, just a question. Um, you meant one of the on one of your slides. You mentioned that um, you, you'd like to have access either the, to the west or to the southwest. I guess. Um, in, into Highway 93, I think you had mentioned to us at one point in time that you actually, CU is actually holding an easement mm -hmm. um, from the edge of your property to 93, which is like probably a really, really short distance, but it doesn't quite get to 93, but you have a some sort of right of way or a right to build a road. Is that right? right. Correct. Correct. And have you talked to the Department of Transportation about their um, interest or appetite in letting um, access go onto Highway 93? We have not yet. Okay. Thanks. I think until we agreed with you, because there are um, some Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan mentions of Highway 93, which really more had to do with a bypass than it did with a general entrance, but I think we should still have a clarifying conversation with the city before we do that. Would you like to comment, Phil? Yeah, and during the comprehensive plan, we did commission a very high level perimeter access study that looked at points of access and identified three on the north side and then one potentially on the south side to Colorado 93. Yes, questions for CU? Mark? You spoke about uncertainty in the process when discussing the, the land swap. I want to suggest that a lot of the uncertainty in these processes have come, frankly, from CU. On January 16th, I'm sorry, on, on February 4th you had a, of 2019, you submitted an annexation agreement in which you committed to provide housing. You amended that um, earlier this year, I believe it was January 16th, where you made the housing a very iffy proposition. Um, on February 18th of this year, um, you submitted a small proposal in which housing was back on the, uh, back on the table although with a new ask for access. Um, in terms of a land swap, uh, I remember, I believe you testified once that it was uh, not something you wanted to consider. Uh, then you buttressed that with at least two written statements in which you didn't want to consider a land swap. And in the most recent submission, you said you're prepared to consider it. That was February 18th, and now it's February 25th, and you really want to take that off the table again. Um, my question is, is this simply the proposal du jour, or is this the one that you really, really mean, and how are we to judge the difference? Um, my head is spinning as if I was Linda Blair and the Exorcist. Um, I have no idea what it is you're actually committing to, and that distresses me. And one last point, um, I am very appreciative of the things that you are doing in terms of the community benefit of this project, but you always seem to uh, fail to list the benefit that is being conferred on CU by the simple act of annexation. We are taking 129 acres which have no immediate value and not by my estimate, but by your estimate, the day after annexation occurs, we have granted you value in between $129 million and $258 million because that's how you value the vacant land. So this, this is a process that is, that is in which both sides are giving great value for what we're trying to achieve, and it's not a one-way process, and I wish you would recognize that a little more. Thank you. And just to respond to that, since it wasn't exactly a question, is um, we would agree that there have been back and forth, and that's true in any negotiation, as you are well aware from your background. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we've been steadily at the table, um, and as I said, we're well on the way, I think, to a good agreement. So, um, you know, these happen, as you know, Mark, in negotiations, and I'm 
not, I don't think the university has not been consistently at the table. Well, you know, I, I believe we have a symbiotic relationship, not an adversarial one, and, and I have not seen enough Which of that symbiosis. Yeah. I have not seen enough of that symbiosis in some aspects of this process, and that's simply my opinion of it. Aaron? Well, um, so anyway, thanks for being here tonight and for that sure. presentation. And um, so I was uh, encouraged to see in this latest submittal of yours a renewed openness to housing, because um, I, I was a little worried about that in that period from we where were you were before. So mm -hmm. glad to hear that there's some, some room there. And so I understand your points about multiple access points. So, um, and so I wonder is, so if we, I know we didn't want to create a bypass between 93 and 36, right? But it seems reasonable that there could be an access point, mm -hmm. you know, to the north to Table Mesa and also an access point to 93, <coughs> as long as it's not like a major road that goes through at 40 miles an hour, right? Maybe there's a gate in the middle or little windy things or speed bumps or whatever. Mm -hmm. The one thing I wanted to uh, check in on was you mentioned the access point to the west. Mm -hmm. And I do want to be sensitive to um, residents in that area who probably don't want a huge amount of traffic coming through their, their local streets. Would you be open to having that access point being primarily uh, like a bike ped kind of a thing with maybe an emergency access or something like, you know, or a few speed bumps so it's not like a super easy and great way to get through, like so that you still have permeability into the mm. neighborhood and particularly ways for, for people not in cars to get through there but not a kind of major traffic flow? I think we can consider that. Okay, yeah. great, thanks. Rachel. I thank you too for that presentation. And um, I would say from the vantage point of somebody who's been living in harm's way uh, for five years and working with city council and CU um, for many of those years trying to get this project moving forward, I've always found CU to be a very willing and um, valued partner who I felt was, was really trying to um, help me get out of harm's way. And so for anybody who's feeling like the head is spinning because see you changed their mind over the last month, um, it, believe me when I say it's much worse when we do things like look at upstream for a year or, or sidetrack into delays that are, are much longer than the month that CU took to consider housing coming off the table was going to be a really bad thing and, and, and possibly keep those of us in harm's way um, for in harm's way for a lot longer. So thank you for reversing course on that. My question is, um, what do you see as the timeline if we were to look at this land swap that I understand you're not um, in favor of in, in terms of when uh, you would, uh, in terms of a year and a, a date to the extent that you're able to guesstimate that. And I haven't um, gone through this before, but my, my understanding is that four plus, so I think it's really five body review, is has never been done quickly. But what do you see as the quickest date that you could possibly, you know, send out whoever you need to look at that land? I don't know that we know. I think Phil has given you as good an estimation as you can get and the difficulties that you face getting it moved from a uh, planning reserve three to two, which is really the crux of the issue. It is not currently eligible to be annexed and that is gonna be the tough nut to crack. Aaron, Mary, <coughs> and Adam, and Junie. Um, and it is to that, to that point, um, it's, it, it seems like that if we were to move the planning reserve into area two, so that takes however long it takes, we get all five bodies to prove it. It seems like at that point we'd be more or less with the university where we were before the 2015 comp plan, right? Because we have those guiding principles, but they're, we wouldn't apply the same guiding principles to the planning reserve, right? So, right, so and, and still needing to evaluate the land itself. We're very familiar with CU South. <laughs> so, so before where we were at the beginning of 2015, because you would need to do your own analysis, and then we would have to kind of start negotiations from scratch at that point. Is that, is that fair to say? I think it's fair. We could probably borrow from some of what we've already created, but it is a different property. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. I have Mary, Adam, and Junie. So Francis and Derek, thanks for coming out tonight. Um, I just wanted to understand um, your master planning process, um, when that will be done, 
what the product will be in terms of how it informs what would happen at CU South, and then how much more time after that there would be more certainty about what um, what kind of zoning, for example, you would need. Um, so if, if you could help me out with that, I'd appreciate it. Uh, sure, uh, so the master plan process, so the, our, our master plan is a 10-year legislative requirement, so every 10 years we do a master plan. 2021 is the next one, so we'll begin that process this year, and much like the comprehensive plan, depending on how things go, uh, it, it could be 2022 when it's done, but we certainly aim to get it done within that time frame of 2021. And that master plan really takes a look at all of our land holdings or all of our campuses and, and, and takes a really high level view of what could be developed on there, not from the perspective of any specific developments, but just more ideation, especially on a track like CU South. It, um, so it, that's not really gonna establish anything firm for CU South, but it will, there will be certain, I say high level principles about what we envision development over that say 10 year and beyond period and beyond. Um, and then that could be changed in another 10 years. So that's the first part of your question is I think the master plan timing and what it would be. So that's the answer to that. The second part. So that would be end of 2021, is that what you said? That's what, that's what we aim for. So the, the date on it is 2021. Uh, so the second part uh, for any development on the site we just don't know, and that the master plan will inform some of that because that will also show where we plan to develop elsewhere on our campus or other campuses. And so coming out of that plan, we we're, it's not gonna give us any indication of a timeline for developing on CU South, that that will arise more organically, especially now that we've recommitted to housing. Uh, it's That's gonna be, a, a, there'll be a lot of public engagement. Um, some of that will be driven from our housing master plan. Uh, which will also feed into the general master plan. But uh, right now, there's just no way we can answer a specific timeline. It could be 2027, it could be 2030. We just don't know. Okay. Thank you for that. And then, Gosh. oh, sorry, I have a second question um, for Phil. And I just wanted clarification on, um, I hear that um, looking at upstream solutions have caused delay. I hear that um, pulling housing off the table has caused delay. Um, in reality, has any of have any of these examinations um, caused delay on the the design of the dam? I think we've we've tried to work on things that aren't necessarily contingent on the flood mitigation project while this latest analysis was taking place. Um, and we've made a little bit of, of progress on those things, but there are components, as I mentioned earlier, that we, we're, we will need to kind of be on a holding pattern until the flood mitigation footprint is a set, is, is a set parameter to work around. Um, and so I, it's a tough question to answer, um, but there may have been, uh, I don't know if I have a great answer for you. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so um, maybe that was a better question for Joe. Um, I'm not sure, but he's not here anymore. Um, oh, there he is. I am. <laughs> I'm still here. <clears throat> so. It, I was looking for you back there. <laughs> It is not uncommon for a project with this level of complexity, a project with this level of complexity to take years and years. I mentioned the Carter Lake Pipeline. Uh, there's another project that we did, the, the Lakewood Pipeline. Lakewood Pipeline took 16 years to get approval, millions of dollars of analysis. Um, the Carter Lake Pipeline, we started working on that in 2003, and it's just getting constructed finally now. And so there's, these complex projects just take a lot of time. Have we gone back and forth on design alternatives that ultimately were deemed infeasible? Yes, that's happened as, as part of this. I will say <clears throat> from what I've seen in, in 2019 up until now, 
and the work that Brandon has been doing with the concept analysis and continuing as we speak today, we are moving forward without delay. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Appreciate it. Um, that's all I have. Adam. Since I have you two here, and this is one of my first opportunities to take a bite at the CU South Apple, um, <laughs> I want to ask you a slightly philosophical question, since this is somewhat of a negotiation. Is any statement that you provide us, since we've had a lot of different statements recently, CU's official position on the matter, or is it you, Derek and Francis, is the project manager's positions on it. Since project uh, managers can change in a process, I've seen it plenty of times yeah. in business. Uh, I'd refer you to the annexation application. That's our statement on the matter. Okay. Uh, Junie? Thank you for this presentation. I thought it was really great. But I wanted to also go back to something that Mark said earlier. Although I don't necessarily agree with everything that he said, but I think he did make a good point. And I think from my understanding, even being here with you today, I, from what I'm hearing is CU is very flexible. And in that flexibility, it leads to inflexibility in a way, right? Meaning that, for instance, I've heard you mentioned, well, we don't want we don't, we don't think that the preserve is a good idea, but we're willing to look at it. So there's, we're hearing many different things in here. So we want to hear firm yes or no. Is it a viable option? Because if it is, it's gonna be a longer term process. And I think now the next question for me to you would be, would it be possible to decouple this process? And I think Mary mentioned that earlier, would it be possible to allow the flood mitigation to go forward since you want to, we're just not sure exactly, I don't know where you stand just from our conversation tonight and I'm sure a lot of community members have the same challenge that I'm having here tonight. So um, I think we're trying to be very clear but also be responsive when we're asked directly. So we actually were asked a year ago by the city would we consider swapping. We said to our understanding, and no acreage was presented, no maps, no information. We said to our understanding, the city has some property, we don't know how much, in an area that is not eligible for annexation. Therefore, it is not comparable property at this time. We have since been asked, what if we could make it eligible? Would you consider it then? So I would say there's as much switching on the city side as CU's side. And as Joe said, this is a complicated process. Negotiations go back and forth. And to expect a partner to take one position and never have it change or be responsive to your request is not um, logical. But I would say that we are trying to be responsive. What we are telling you is what we know of that reserve. It's a tough go. And if you can move it from area three to area two, then we will look at it. And I think we're being fairly clear on that point. Can I follow up? I just wanted to follow up because I think part of where I stand is that, and I think we all, everyone here in this room and everyone in this community wants flood mitigation because it's about protecting lives. We agree. Is it possible to move forward with flood mitigation while CU and the rest of the city and the rest of us are still discussing whether this particular land is viable? I understand with the 129 acres in CU South and the comparability of Area 3, is it possible to move forward and what would that look like? I don't know if that's more a question for city staff. So it's almost like how can we separate these two so that we can move forward. The university has stated as its position over a year ago and it has not changed and this has been confirmed with our senior management and regions that no, we cannot split the property. It needs to be done as one package. Yeah, so I would also like to add, um, Junie, in response to your question about us um, having different positions, we, we actually have one position on the land swap and that's that we think it's a very low probability. We don't think it's a good idea. But to be flexible, we're res we've been responsive to the city council's request to, it, to, to, to have that flexibility. And so that's what we're trying to do. I think we can do that and we can be skeptical of, the, of, the, of whether that can ever get done while still being flexible and allowing it to move forward. We just have to have certain conditions. Uh, for instance, 
we, we just cannot spend our time evaluating a piece of land that isn't even annexes, annexable. It's not even in the realm of possibility. And there's a, I think there's a huge, um, there's a hurdle to get to even that point. And if you can get to that point, then we're willing to take a fair look at it, so. Any more questions for CU? Go ahead, Mark. I wanna circle back to something Junie said. If, if, if this council is prepared to commit to uh, an annexation of either the CU South property or the planning reserve property, even at your discretion, since you're not in a hurry to build tomorrow, why can't we decouple those two processes since in order to build the flood mitigation project, we need about five acres. Um, we are prepared to do so uh, through an annexation process that will give you what you need for a campus, whether it's here or there. If your interest is similar to ours in terms of accelerating um, flood mitigation and not holding it mm -hmm. hostage to an ultimate resolution of, of where your campus is located, why can't you do that? Well, I would Why be, won't you do that is no, really the question. I would be very curious, Mark, about what commitments and assurances you can give us that would let us know that we can bank on that. Mm -hmm. Until we get annexation, until we have an agreement, I don't know how we can bank on any commitment prior to. We could have an agreement that says we agreed that you will, be, you will have one or the other property as your campus. I don't think that you are able to commit at a legal level that would satisfy the university. So we have had conversations with our legal counsel about this. So it's not just Derek and me sitting here making this stuff up. Um, but it would be a difficult process um, and you have, you have to get from area three to area two. That's quite a challenge for you mm -hmm. with, as, as Rachel points out, five bodies involved in that. Um, and then we have to go through the annexation process. In the meantime, CU needs to be evaluate property for comparability, which is part of our requirement under our annexation as originally filed. But if, if the property, if the processes were decoupled, you would have ample time to do that analysis since you have no immediate we, plans to build. We have stated we are not interested in decoupling the process. Well, I understand, so I'm, asking, a, I'm asking that why is that is. Because we don't think there's the motivation in the community to annex a property for CU in the future. Okay. So we need to keep them together. All right, so this is, you're just using it as leverage then. I understand. As you are on the, on the city's part, but yes. I, I understand. Rachel. So as a person in harm's way, again, just as I used to feel out there, I would say what I'm feeling at this table is that it's not CU holding anybody hostage. If, if we move down this very non-compromising road, it's gonna be city council um, holding community members hostage and being unprotected. So I want that to be very clear that, that CU has a, a duty to a state taxpayer and um, I, I can't imagine that it would be uh, within <laughs> their, anywhere in their best interest to um, give us 64 acres of land with nothing in exchange. How can I, if I live in Pueblo or at Littleton or anywhere else in Colorado, think that that is an okay use of my tax money? I think that the same way that we believe CDOT when they say something, when we believe OSBT when they say something, we've got to believe <laughs> CU when they say something. They are a community partner. They are not the villain here. And I think we need to be um, respectful and and savvy enough to appreciate that they do have a, a business interest. I don't think that they're holding us hostage, but I think we have to be reasonable negotiators as well. And the land swap that we're talking about in the north of town requires the county to weigh in from two different boards. It requires our planning board to weigh in. It requires people that we don't even know who are gonna be elected next year to weigh in, who are gonna be appointed next month to weigh in. There are so many unknowns. There's no way that I can, as an attorney, imagine that CU can can remotely accept a, a promise of a theoretical possible area three gift. So that I think we're asking too much on. Uh, and I'll if we're serious- Rachel, if it's yep. okay, I yep. will just say that we've clearly moved into discussion and debate <laughs> out of questions. So if we can, I think all these sides need to be uh, talked about. Does anyone have any more questions 
offers to you while we have them, if that's okay, because I, I would, I have more questions as well for our park staff. So if it's possible, we get It's past okay, but I think the people before me also were not asking questions. Well, so I, I, I feel a little bit disrespected on that. Not just you, but I, I you know, went from Mark to you and I'm like, okay, I apologize if I disrespected you. Yeah, I'm just trying to get us to questions if we have them, and then we'll move on, and then I will give you the floor as soon as we come back for debate to start with. May I put a final capstone on that? I what? May I put a final capstone on that discussion? Sure. I think the point is, yes, we serve the state, and we have a mission within the state constitution that we must meet and adhere to while working to be good community partners and we're striving to do that. But to ask us to completely abandon our mission is not reasonable. Okay, thank you for being here. Um, and stay and enjoy our discussion. Okay, you have a question, great. It's probably a joint question both for CU and for Phil. <clears throat> I, um, I, I don't think, or I guess I'll form a, a form of a question. We're not asked, being asked to decide anything here tonight with respect to annexation. This is more of an update, I appreciate your um, uh, presentation. We understand, I think, a little bit better where you're at right now. You've been uh, clear on that tonight. Um, but we're not being asked to decide. We, we made a decision of the night with Joe. I think Joe's happy that we, <laughs> he can go home with a decision. But we, we're not, you're not, neither neither the city staff nor CU is asking us to make a decision with respect to annexation. Is that correct? Yeah. This is just a discussion, but we're not deciding anything tonight. Yeah, initially when we were thinking about the study session, it was initially focused on flood mitigation and then the housing question came into play and that's what yeah. we wanted to tee up for council. Right. That's been, that's changed since. And so okay. it's it's resolved a little bit. So we can continue this discussion in parallel with all the great work that Joe's doing. Great, thanks. Great. Um, so thank you for being here. <clears throat> Much appreciated. Uh, Anyone else have questions for staff before we launch into discussions? I had some for parks that I held back a little bit. Anyone else have questions? So Rachel, well, parks is coming up. If you'd like to complete your thought, I'm sorry I interrupted. Well, I, I wish that my memory worked as well to, to have held on to that. But um, I, I guess I do have a, a question that's maybe for CU, um, maybe for staff, and maybe for discussion. But um, if we were to move forward with the variant one, 100, plan that's on the table and annexation for CU South. Could we get to a point where we annex that because that is what we have in our power to do now and then get some sort of a, a tentative request for CU to say before we put a, a shovel in the dirt, if you have annexed CU North potentially by then, we will give, we will promise to give a a good faith effort to review that land because if it's not gonna work for CU if they review it now, I don't know why it would work for them if they review it in two years, if and when we have annexation done. So is it feasible that we could annex CU South? I'm gonna ask people over here to, to be a little bit quieter because I'm having trouble hearing myself. Um, is it possible that we could annex and then do annex on the other side, uh, what I'm calling CU North into the city and then swap that? I would say that uh, we couldn't give any assurance on that. Um, it would be, I, I don't know what kind of assurance we could give to to look at it in the future, especially if we've got our land annexed. And just to be direct, I think if we have our land annexed, our focus will be on the annexed land. And um, unless there was some, some value that we saw in the future to actually consider that swap, uh, I can't see where we could give an assurance on that. Anyone else? So my questions for Parks <clears throat> were really about um, <clears throat> kind of how that park came in. And so we have the 0.25 tax that, that came into place. And my recollection, or at least the read, was that we annexed, sorry, not annexed, we, we bought that park land because it was an opportunity. You know, the 190 whatever acres up there, that was really inexpensive at the time. And then wasn't it after that that we bought Valmont Park? Yeah, so again, Jeff Haley, Parks and Rec. Um, I'd have to go back and research all the, the timeline and the history of when the parcels were acquired. Um, basically, from my recollection, what I can put together is in 95, there was some discussion about needing to acquire more parkland for a variety of purposes. There was a whole selection team um, that was looking at park sites across the community 
Um, and so as part of that, yes, Valmont City Park, those parcels were acquired, the Area 3 parcels were acquired, and some others as well. Um, that was actually back when um, Parks and Rec and Mountain Parks were all one thing before the open space in Mountain Parks. So there was a variety of acquisitions during that time. Um, Valmont was included in that. Okay, and it seems like since that time, no effort's gone into the Area 3 park, but Valmont's been developed and there's other phases that are intended to come at Valmont, is that right? That's correct. And that's fairly geographically close um, as, as a big regional park um, to uh, the land in the planning reserve, correct, that park zones? That's correct. And so the, uh, our current master plan has different classifications of parkland, neighborhood parks, community parks, and then the highest is the regional parks or city parks. So that includes Valmont City Park, um, the Boulder Reservoir is a regional park, and then this Area 3 parcels would be considered in that same classifica um, classification in terms of a large 100 to 300 acre area that has a variety of amenities. Um, and yeah, Valmont is more centrally located. Um, you know, it was scheduled for development earlier on. Um, it's closer into the city's core. Uh, we do have concept plans for that park. Um, and I did want to just go back earlier as we were talking about, is there funding identified or what that process would be with our advisory board? Our master plan does reference Area 3. Um, basically, it sets aside land just like it did when it was originally acquired for future park needs. So when we look at a variety of things like benchmarking, levels of service, how do we provide amenities to the community, um, we do calculate that acreage to be needed um, to meet our certain levels of service. So right now our current master plan identifies a goal of 2030 to have about eight acres per, per, per thousand population of that classification, and Area 3 is one of those ways that we'll be able to reach that. So. That identifies some needs um, for Area 3 in terms of just acreage. Um, at the same time, we've done some athletic studies where we know that we'll need approximately nine ball fields in the future uh, around 2030 to meet current demand with population, et cetera. So all those things, all those aspects go into effect of how that Area 3 has been set aside and what that really means to our department. I see. And so when you went through that eight acres per thousand people calculation, where do we sit now? Uh, I believe it's about 7.1. 7, 7 we can look at the, the needs assessment. 7.1 that's been developed or that's within the city? Like how does that um, roughly 200 acres of Area 3 land play into that calculation? So there's no, yeah, so that, that whole classification of parkland, which includes Valmont, the Boulder Reservoir, Area 3, um, I'd have to look through my notes. Um, in fact, Allison might have that table. Thank you, our director, Allison Rhodes. Thank you. Um, yeah, so for, for city and regional parks, um, we have a total acreage of 700. Um, about 274 of those acres are developed. Um, yeah, and so the current level of service is about 7.3 acres per thousand population. Okay, so 200, and that's developed acres per population? That's right. I see, okay. All right, that's all I had. I yeah. was just curious if you had any uh, opinion about how the Parks Board might look at a swap. So Correct. it would, just theoretically, if we had 160 acres in the northern section and we swapped with CU South in some way, and that would leave some amount, 30 acres, for a park still in that northern site that would be near CU. How do you think the Parks Board or your staff would look at the opportunities at CU South? You know, in fact, so we've heard a lot about master planning and, and different approaches this evening. We're currently in the process of kicking off our department master plan update. Um, so our last plan was done in 2014, adopted by council. Um, I would believe that our staff as well as our board would want to look at updating that needs assessment. And what would go into that is, again, like I said, benchmarking comparisons with all the types of facilities. Um, as we discussed a minute ago, proximity analysis, um, how close are parks to the neighborhoods, to future development, um, how that aligns with the different areas of town um, within the community. So I can't really say at this point, like, 
how that would go. Um, I think all that information would need to be gathered. Um, as a lot of folks have talked about, just the process and the timeline and these Venn diagrams of how this all overlaps. Mm -hmm. So we'd want to see um, if we were to add those amenities in the southern part of town, would that really be meeting the intention and the need throughout the community? Um, but I, I can't really say for sure right now how the, the advisory board res would respond to that. We'd have to look at the data and, and see how that all um, kind of checks out. Got it. And is your next master plan due in 2024? Is it a 10 year cycle? No, so this next update will be complete in 2021. So 2021. Okay. Yeah, it's it's an update to the current plan that was that was done in 2014. So over the next year and a half, we'll complete that. Okay, that's all I had. Anyone else? Thank you. So if we want to move to discussion, Rachel, again, I'll give you the floor first if you want to lead us off. I appreciate that. Um, I will say that I I live a stone's throw from CU South, and. I will be the first in line to love it if that becomes a 160-acre park. Um, I think that most of my uh, neighbors to the north will not like it, and I don't honestly see any benefit on the table to looking at this swap. Um, we've established that it doesn't help the flood mitigation process at all. It's, um, I think, pretty poor governance because we are adding to our workload. We're asking staff to pursue two different annexation opportunities that, uh, you know, kind of streamlined for no reason. I think what it does is um, answers some community requests to not let CU be developed, CU South. People don't want it developed. I don't think people north of town are going to want CU North developed either. I don't see um, any benefit. I don't understand how land swap got here. It was brought up previously. It's now been recycled. When this happens on this project, it's usually um, sort of buying a little bit of time. Anytime we get close to like nailing it down, we move the goalposts. So if we're moving the goalposts, it better be for a super good necessary reason. CU is not building in the 500 year floodplain. We have a, a workable plan. So my question, and, and I have some sub questions that I will get to is, why are we looking at this? What is in it for um, Boulder? Again, I'm psyched if that part comes to me, but I, I don't see it as a community benefit, and I don't know why we're even talking about this. Eric? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with what, what Rachel has said. I just say, I'd say on the positive side, I mean, I, f I feel like we're making real progress. Like, I feel like we're getting close, you know? So I've, I'm coming into the, this meeting in one sense, I think is, is exciting and encouraging because I think we, we heard a consensus from council on the 100 year um, approach for flood mitigation that feels accomplishable. Um, we've got CU at the table. They're willing to look at housing. Sounds like the asks around, around that are manageable. So it, it feels like we're getting close and we have something that within you know, a manageable period of time would allow us to move forward with flood mitigation, um, which of course our community is so desperately waiting for. So I, I would just, I would really hate us to see us add in an, a, a very large level of uncertainty with this pursuit of the planning reserve, which would um, take multiple years, have the uncertainty of a five body review, all of whom would need to uh, approve this by a majority. And after that years of work and getting through all five bodies would kind of start us back to where we were, you know, five years ago with CU. So it, it seems inevitable that it, in even the best case scenarios, it would produce very large delays for the flood mitigation project. So I just love for us to, to take this opportunity that's getting close and move forward and get the flood mitigation done. Who wants to go next? The, the issue um, in terms of the annexation is not let's get it done, let's get it done. It's, well, it is, but we don't know what we would be annexing. And that's, that's, that's the, the, the crux, um, at least for me, is we don't know what we would be annexing. And Derek said that by 2021, the master plan will be done. It'll be high level, and it won't be until 2027 that there would be any definitive plans as to exactly what they would want. Um, I don't think it would be responsible as, um, as someone who has fiduciary duty to the city, not the university, um, to 
and it would be very irresponsible to annex. We don't know what we're annexing. I um, mean, and, and just basically um, rough sketches that maybe are outlined a little bit at the master plan level. I, I would feel really, really uncomfortable with that. And that's why um, I would like to see us find a way as collaborating partners, as members of the same community, um, because ultimately the university and the city are members of the same community and we're protecting the same people. And that's what our concern should be, is to provide the safety for um, folks. and. I would like us to find a way forward that considers the fact that we need to move forward with the flood mitigation, that we understand that we can't do an annexation without knowing what we're annexing. We just, we just can't. I, 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 would, I just, that would be irresponsible. So um, I remember a few years back when we were talking about um, the Ponderosa Mobile Home Park that had been badly damaged in the 2013 flood. And staff came to council and, um, and council said, um, no displacement, and staff had said, well, it's really hard to not displace anyone when some people that live there may not be documented. And council said, no displacement or no deal on annexation. Staff came back with a plan for no displacement. So I guess the challenge that I would put out there is um, for council to say, and for the university, let's work together. Let's work together as collaborating partners, as members of the same community who are concerned with the safety of residents living in the West Valley, and let's find a way forward that considers the needs of the community first, because that's where all these Venn diagrams line up, is in the safety of the community, and then considers um, the needs of the university and considers the needs of the city in terms of knowing what we're annexing. I mean, that's my problem is I don't know what we'd be annexing. So I, it would just not fly with me. So, um, so I would challenge us to find a way forward, whether it's in incremental MOUs or IGAs, I don't know. I mean, that's for the lawyers to figure out. Um, but that's my concern is, and I put that challenge out there, let's find a way forward where we can get the flood mitigation and and find a way forward with annexation in a manner that um, allows the city to know what we're annexing. I have a colloquy question. I thought that the comp plan or guiding principles already allowed that we weren't going to know what we were annexing and that we were going to be moving forward and annex and that people at this table probably signed on to that agreement, um, that, that there was going to be some ambiguity in the annexation agreement. So I don't know why, I mean, talk about, you know, head spinning, like why would we be questioning that today? I don't, I, don't, I, I thought that was how it was set up. I mean, would you like a response? We can, <clears throat> um, I believe that what we did was we did the land use designation. So that I don't think we're moving very far on. So we changed the land use map and we put in place additional protections for if it was annexed, um, that there would be some limitations that they would agree to in the annexation agreement. But I don't think there was a commitment to annex um, because we weren't sure the flood was gonna work. That's exactly it, yeah. It's meant to guide these conversations and I think it's been serving that purpose. We looked at it really as a more of a performance-based standard and limitations to development and so certain height limits and other things as well as the per performance standards being an example of a uh, transportation standard. So like setting a trip budget for the site in terms of what is our capacity on the surrounding roadway and what can it handle and working into our standards that way. Can I, can I continue that colloquy though? I mean, I agree we did not commit to annexation in the guiding principles, but I think the guiding principles laid out a, a path that the, the next steps would consist of figuring out the details of flood mitigation and working on an annexation with CU that followed those guiding principles. 
it in no way said that we were going to figure out exactly uh, exactly the shape of the buildings that would go on that site. I mean, I think we when we all, when we were working on this a few years ago, were knew that that conversation, that, that when we got to annexation, that we would not have a map of ex exactly what buildings were where. Adam? So I'm gonna just provide a slightly alternative view as someone who lives in the area affected by um, this. I live on the corner of Foothills and Baseline in a sub-ground level unit. I'm extremely aware of our flooding issues and I still think it's okay to take some time to understand the holistic view of everything, to, to question the environmental impacts, to make sure that, you know, um, we do make, you know, check out the area or the um, expansion area in the north just as an option. Sure, maybe it doesn't happen, but it's worth having the conversations to me simply because it takes a little bit of hubris as a human to say, I am the most important at all points, my protection, despite the fact that I know I live in a flood area, um, it, it's gotta be about me right now. And I think the community does need to understand that to some degree that a long time ago, Boulder was established in 16 drainage areas. Like, okay, and we live with that fact today. Um, and we're gonna continue to live with that fact for the future of our community, uh, however long that ends up being. So um, I'm okay with taking a little bit of time on these things simply because yes, life and safety is the absolute most important thing that we provide, but this isn't the only flood zone, this isn't the only area, and it's not like people don't have the option if they want to, to leave the area because of the flood zone. So. I'm gonna colloquy on that. <laughs> I'm gonna colloquy on that and say, uh, point to the people that we as, as a city have put into harm's way since the flood who are <laughs> recently um, given vouchers to be um, given housing who were formerly homeless. They don't even know that they're in the flood zone. Like we are putting the most vulnerable people right there. And this is not hubris talking. And this has been a very patient, trip down a long road that started in 2003. So to act that the last five years wasn't enough time to look at options, to act that the last time that we talked about a land swap wasn't a good enough option, and to to think that it's um, the same thing to be in, you know, you're, you're a, a bit of water's way versus flash flooding where your kid's gonna die if they sleep in the basement is, is a really different equation. So it's upsetting to me that it would be considered hubristic if that's the right word for my neighbors to um, be concerned about their safety. That is, this has been a long discussion. This is not rapid or speedy. This is not the first time the planning reserve has come up. So, uh, you know, if we wanna look at it, we're gonna look at it. And I, I sense there's gonna be a majority will to look at that, but it is a delay and it is saying that people's lives aren't that important. So I've got Junie and then Bob and then Mark. I just wanted to add that this is a very, very difficult conversation and I can see there a lot of us are really emotional and it's really upsetting even to me as well. Although I don't live in CU South because it is about protecting people's lives. But at the same time, we have to understand the reality is from what, I'm, from what I've heard is that CU is not looking at this option, it's not viable. Even if we were to decide to go down that path, it's not a viable option, they don't want it. So I think delaying is just not good for anybody. It's not good for us, it's not good for them. So I think again, taking the time but on to pursue that option, but on whose time? When is the next flood? We don't know. So I think we have to consider the lives of the people living in that area. And then when we were talking about the park, um, the planning reserve, and I was thinking, gosh, and we talk about equity so much here on this council since I've been on it, and it's so inspiring, but at the same time, we're, we're saying, let's just swap the land, you know, and then these people may not have a park. And I think it goes back to what Aaron said. People in the North deserve a park as well, if it's possible, right? So at the end of the day, I'm just not sure. I feel like we're talking past each other. 
We've been doing that all night. And I think we need to find a solution, and that solution is flood mitigation. And I think we have to do, since we cannot just usurp and just take over the land, we have to work with CU, and that is CU South annexation. And I, to me, from what I'm hearing in, in this room, that's the most viable option, and we have to do it to protect people's lives, and we cannot just take forever and take our time to get that done because we don't know when is the next flood. Thanks. Bob and then Mark. So keep, keeping your options open does not always involve delay. Oftentimes you have several paths ahead of you and um, you can keep those options open without slowing things down. And I think we've, um, I agree with Aaron that we made great progress tonight. We've given Joe and his team the direction that they needed. And so that engineering work is continuing unabated and this is a discussion we will undoubtedly have um, <clears throat> again in the coming weeks and months. But the good news is, is um, regardless of how often we have this discussion and what the ultimate outcome of it is, um, Joe's team has got the direction they want and they're going to proceed forward. And that's the critical path, right? The, the discussion tonight is not going to change what Joe does. At some point in time, it could change what Joe does, but it's not going to change tomorrow or the next day or the next day. So this is a discussion we can continue. Um, so I, I think keeping options open is, is almost always a good thing if it doesn't cause delay. And we haven't heard that it will cause delay to keep options open. So to that end, I actually have two questions of staff or two requests of staff. Um, one, um, with respect to CU South, um, it would be helpful, I mean, CU was very clear tonight that um, housing's back on the table, but if and only if they could get access to the west or southwest, including Highway 93. So I'd like to know if that's a problem, because um, we um, made the mistake a few years ago of assuming things of the Department of Transportation, and, and we um, had a very un unpleasant surprise, and we had to make some pretty big shifts. And so let's kind of bottom that out sooner rather than later. And so I would suggest that um, our city staff and CU um, approach DOT, can, especially since CU has a, apparently a easement or right of way 293. Let's find out if that's a problem because if the Department of Transportation says no way, no how, um, I guess the question would then be is CU taking housing back off the table? And that would be an important thing for us to know. So let's just find that out sooner rather than later. And if council, some of us in council have relationships with the Department of Transportation, so if we can facilitate, we don't get in your way, but if we can facilitate those conversations, it would be, it'd be nice to know the answer to that within weeks, not months. Um, the second request um, for information, you don't have to answer this now, Phil and Chris Meschuk, I don't think it's in the room, but it, one of the things I was not thrilled with when we decided back in December to authorize the, um, what was it called, the Baseline Services Urban Services, I can never remember the name of it, the Baseline Urban Services Study, yeah. something like that, yeah. you know what I'm talking about, that y y um, you guys said, hey, can we do it? And we said, sure, that sounds great, keeps our options open. And then you said, okay, we'll start it in 2021. I'm like, oh, well, okay, how, why, why that? And um, <clears throat> so I, I'd appreciate if you guys could come back and explain um, why, and again, I'm not necessarily advocating for a land swap, there, but I'd like to, to understand, is there a good, really good reason why we wouldn't do that this year as opposed to waiting a year or two to do that? I, and maybe you guys were simply backing into 2025, knowing that the earliest that could be a change in the Area 3 Planning Reserve was 2025, so you weren't in a big rush. But um, would there be things on the planning staff's plate that would be displaced yeah, if you yes, had to start there would. that? Yes, there okay. would. So you want to answer that question now, mm -hmm. or do you want to come back later with well, the specifics Well, it looks like that? Jim is able to answer it. Yeah. I think it's a matter of priorities, and you'd have to take some things off in order to start the plan, but It'd Jim may have more details. What those are. Yeah, yeah, and and you were correct about backing in the 2025. We, that was kind of the normal process uh, yeah. that we were talking sure. about. Um, I can't, I can't sit here tonight and t oh, excuse me, Jim Robertson, uh, comprehensive planning manager in the planning department. Um, I can't sit here tonight and tell you exactly this would be displaced, this would be delayed, and so forth. I can tell you. Um, that conducting a baseline urban services study is a significant body of work with, it, with, with which we in the planning department would have a significant role, but because of the way a baseline urban services is uh, described in a comp plan, it invokes the work of virtually every city department, um, police, mm -hmm. fire, library, 
water, wastewater, stormwater, transportation, and so forth. Um, and so we haven't scoped what it would look like um, to do that. We would, and, and, and I can tell you, it's not on anyone's work plan right now. Knowing what we do know, not having scoped it, but knowing what we do know, um, I think I'm safe in saying it would be a significant body of work. And if you told us to, to, to start that now, as opposed to when we talked about it at the retreat, I think I'm safe in saying it would displace current work. We would have to have a conversation with you around what gets to place, what gets put on hold, what gets the schedule gets changed, and so forth. Okay, well, that's fine. Um, I'm, I'm not asking you to do that um, mm -hmm. unless there's a majority in council would ask you to do that. <clears throat> when I say do that, that is do the reporting of what it would displace, not do the work. I mean, you're going to do the work eventually. You already committed to do the work next year. And the, my, my question would be what would it displace if you did the work? six or 12 months sooner than you had otherwise planned to do this massive body of work. So it's just a timing question. Um, but we'll, we'll see if other council members are interested in that information. If they're not, don't don't fuss yourself with it. If you hear a couple other two, two, three other people that say they'd be interested in what it would displace, maybe you guys could just put together a quick memo and say this is what it would entail to, to accelerate work that you're already going to do. Thanks. Mark? Yeah. I want to go back to a question you raised, Bob, about whether the housing goes back off the table if there's a problem with getting the access off of 93. Um, if there is no housing in this transaction, which is, a, is a, one of the guiding principles, um, I'm not sure I would support this annexation. I mean, it, it's, it's, the, it's the raison d'etre of, of this transaction. And if it is an on-again, off-again kind of proposition, um, that's really not very satisfactory to me as we as we move forward. On a more general basis, I, I, I th the issue of looking at the alternatives to me is, is to get to the best solution, um, provided we don't have undue delay. And I'm, I'm perfectly prepared to take a look at other uh, opportunities that may be better for the city of Boulder and may be better for the university. It's an unresolved issue, but I, I would be more than happy to, to take a look at it. Um, and just one comment where I, where I have to differ with my colleague Rachel, um, it's always being described as what we are doing to put people in harm's way. And my comment to that is it, the tethering of um, annexation to flood mitigation, which is a business decision that, that CU is entitled to make, but to me that is what uh, creates the, the, the greatest possibility for delay and roadblock in this transaction. And the unwillingness to decouple those, um, again, that's your business decision to make, um, but I think that the onus for delay falls more upon CU than, than this council in terms of being dilatory in its process. We're spending millions of dollars on engineering. Uh, we are spending an, a huge amount of staff time. Uh, I don't think it is appropriate to say that we are not moving forward with all the dispatch that we can muster. And tonight we've made a very critical decision uh, along those lines. Rachel. So I, um, I haven't gotten a real satisfactory question from fellow council members, so I'm going to ask staff um, what they might see as any benefit to this land swap or pros and cons. Because um, again, I'm, I'm, it, it feels like it just sort of dropped out, and so we're going to look at it. And I don't, I'm not clear on what the benefits are that we're looking at. So if any staff could weigh in on that, I, I would be grateful. to think but um, and just to add like I, I think that we are not the experts as council people so we rely on you and sometimes I think we um, insert our voices over expert opinions and I'm, I want to be mindful of, of not doing that the, the benefit could be that land in the planning reserve may have fewer environmental constraints than that of CU South relating to floodplain steep slopes uh, wetlands and other environmental constraints so there may be fewer out there um, that would be put one potential benefit. Um, another potential benefit is if the parks and recreation long range planning did decide that it, that was a net gain to do some type of land swap, then that could be a benefit. But I don't know if, as you, as you heard, that that would be the case. A downside would be the unknowns for us. 
um, of getting down the line um, a couple of years and having something not work out um, a couple of years down the line with the planning reserve could be a significant risk. Um, and in my, again, inexpert, just mind's eye, I would think it sounds like we're going to have to like slaughter a lot of prairie dogs, and so that's going to be a, a huge issue whenever we bring prairie dogs in. Um, we're going to be um, poten potentially um, asking a lot of people and potentially couples who, who one half works at CU and the other half works in Denver to cut through the heart of Denver and a transportation um, way that is not nearly as convenient to the RTD at, at um, see you north might be so I, I guess have we at what point would we look at like it, I'm understanding CU's not committal on this but I, I don't know that why the city wants to look at it either and then Aaron had a follow-up I, th I think we would be seeking direction from council about whether to look at it right I mean I, I think we might we might look to our fellow council members for to, to to advocate for that but I just one one issue that hasn't been brought up yet with this um, possibility is the transportation issues and so I guess when I think about well what are the potential downsides you know the the this planning reserve parcel has literally zero transit to the site whereas CU South has I think 10 or so bus lines that run right there it's one of our most transit rich area of town areas of town so it, it is part of what I try to wrap my head around a possible benefit to see north is um, is that it's further away from the university and and has no transit options and so how many vehicle miles traveled would we be adding to the community and isn't that contradictory to our climate goals uh, so it, it seems like a, a real negative in that sense as, as well Harry. Hey. I'm gonna say that the land swap idea isn't as big a priority for me as it is to find a way that we can um, annex, w get to a point where we know what we're annexing at annexation. That's really what it comes down to for me. So, you wanna say something else? Yeah. Yeah, go for so, it. Yeah, I pretty much agree with Mary. Like. I do want to find the fastest solution when it comes to actually solving the problem at this point. It's just um, we can we can you know pick apart every single thing like vehicle miles traveled all we want. Like if CU didn't develop the land at all, that would probably be the best carbon thing that we have. I mean, there, you know, we can go down that road forever. But um, at the end of the day, I agree with Mary. It's our job to find the fastest path forward mm -hmm. and the one that's actually going to help people. Journey. I just have a question. I don't fully understand what you mean, Mary, by you don't understand or you don't know what you're annexing. And so I just need a little bit more clarity. Sure. Thank you. Um, so it's been the city's policy that upon annexation, and correct me if I'm wrong, ba, um, Tom, that um, upon annexation, we try to extract um, 40 to 50 percent affordable housing. That's our biggest um, community benefit that we get from annexation. The other thing that we typically do with annexation, and I've never seen one that doesn't do this, is annex with a site plan. Um, and a site plan is what lays out where the buildings are, what type of building, you've got the zoning planned out. Um, so by not knowing what we're annexing, you just don't know what you're gonna get. You don't even know if you're gonna get the housing. Um, so that concerns me and I would like to, like I said, find a way where we can get to a point, maybe it's not a full um, site plan, maybe it's something, you know, that resembles more like a concept plan. Um, and maybe we get to that point in steps, in increments of um, IGAs, intergovernmental agreements. I, I don't know, like I said, that's for the attorneys to figure out, but what we need to do here is be able to move on the flood mitigation 
And, you know, really, the way I look at it, it's not the city that's standing in the way of the annexation. It's the university's master planning process um, in the sense that it won't be done until the end of 2021, and then you won't know, they won't know what they want until 2027. So that's how I see it. And um, like I said, we can come to the table and figure something out and I believe we could, um, or we can continue to have these fruitless arguments. Um, so I've, I'm willing to give on the, the planning reserve. I, I'm not, I don't want to bark up that tree if it means um, barking up a wrong tree. <laughs> And that's that's kind of what it's sounding like um, to me, based on everything I've heard tonight. Is that um, we just don't know. There's there's just so many unknowns in terms of you get all the way down to um, whether or not it will annex, and then you do have a four body review at the end of that. So I'm not so sure that that's a great idea. But what I do want to know is what are we annexing when we annex? You have more, Jeannie? Yes, I just, is there anyone who can answer that question to, to a satisfactory manner? And then my next question is, my understanding is, when it comes to CU South, the community benefit is not just housing, but it's also the flood mitigation. Maybe I'm wrong. So can someone clarify? Thank you. So I, I, I'll, I'm not sure I can do it satisfactory, but I'll try to answer the question as what best I can about annexation. This is a particularly complicated issue. Uh, usually when we do an annexation, we're doing a few houses and, or we're doing a, a vacant land and as Mary says, there's a site plan. So council, when they approve the annexation agreement, has a pretty good idea about what's gonna happen on the property. Because either it's, it's built already and has limited development potential or you have a site plan that says this is how we're gonna develop it. Um, the challenge here is, is multi-leveled because uh, this is your one chance to look at this property. Uh, because CU is a state agency, they don't generally comply with our restrictions. So because you, you have to approve annexation, any, any restrictions that you want to put on this property have to be in the annexation agreement. And so as I understand what Mary's saying, and forgive me if I've got it wrong, is usually you'd have great detail about what would happen on a property before you agreed to an annexation. Um, here, we'd have to write an incredibly detailed annexation agreement with the restrictions that council wanted down to, say, the number of units, the style of buildings, the size of buildings, the placement, uh, to, it, the, I, for council to get the level it would normally have in an annexation agreement. And then you overlay the fact that we're dealing with a state agency. Um, so normally, so even if we don't have all that detail, we have base zoning requirements that we, you, you do an initial zoning. So you do single family zoning. You, they, they can only build so many things under our code. Well, that doesn't constrain CU, the code doesn't. So you'd have to have all of that in the annexation agreement. So as I hear what Mary's saying, she wants to hear how we work together to get those kind of restrictions in an agreement that council felt comfortable approving that protected the community in the way you want to see it protected in the long range for the development of this property. And could I jump in on that? Because yeah. I mean, I think, in, and Francis, you may want to say, I saw you raise your hand, but if I can just say something first that, I mean, it, it's an excellent point. And I've, I have always imagined that, that we would draw, that there'd be a process line from the guiding principles, which lay out kind of, you know, the, the amount of housing, the type of housing, a, a maximum height limit and things like that. And that when you get to the annexation agreement, we can codify those things and, and potentially add some additional layers of specificity. And this would be part of the negotiation process, right? That, that if we signal that we're willing to sit down at the table and work these things out, then I think we can try to come to some level of understanding that, that, that bridges the gap between the guiding principles and the exact details that are in the annexation agreements. I, I think, you know, it may not be easy, but I think we have the ability to sit down and try to work these things out, is it? So I think I'm gonna jump, Rachel, do you wanna say something? Yes, okay. 
So I know this is a vexing problem that we don't have a site plan for you. And that is because the city asked the university to bring forward an annexation application now because there was a strong interest in getting the flood mitigation done. So we complied with that, and in the four-body process that we went through for the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan, we did a lot of the um, guiding principles to address some of these issues that Tom was talking about. So height limitations that we would comply with that we normally wouldn't be subject to, um, those kinds of things. And I think Aaron raises a good point. What we've been doing with staff is trying to refine some of those elements in the annexation agreement as we go, as f so that we have a reasonably defined box in which we would develop those plans later down the road. Um, and part of the problem is, and I'd just like to correct, we've never said there would be no housing on the site. What we've said is, with the dam across the front of the property, we'd need to take under evaluation whether housing behind the dam was still a good idea. Could we produce a product back there that our faculty, staff, and upper division students would find attractive um, with one road in, one road out? And there, I think there is a possibility for solving that. So I think we're very much at the table about that. It won't be what you're used to because you asked us to come forward early in this process, and there are many benefits that we're bringing um, as Aaron pointed out, that are different from a normal annexation, or as Tom pointed out, this isn't two or three houses. We are not a developer looking to make a quick profit and get out of Dodge. We live in Dodge, so we intend to stay here and finalize this process with you all. Okay, so I think I'll jump in with a few thoughts here um, at this point. So it sounds to me like this is an especially complex annexation agreement for all the reasons that Tom just said and we understand. So it is not clear to me that we will stay on the timeline that we hope to be on. I hope we are, but some of the concerns raised by Mary and um, others, and I've shared them because we have heard a changing story from CU over time, and that's to, that's fine. I'm not being super critical of that, but at one point we had a bubble diagram that included the 1,100 homes, sorry, the 1,100 dwelling units, as well as a million square feet of classroom space, which we then said, no, that's really not what we're thinking, and so we worked in order to get the guiding principles as good as we could get them but there's still nothing like a full-blown annexation document that's going to have a lot more restrictions. Other things that I think I heard are the transport, you know, study. We, we don't yet understand what we're buying into for transportation load and so on at that site. And part of it we're never going to know because we may know 1,100 dwelling units, but what else is going to go there? You know, it is totally unclear what is going to show up there, and therefore we won't have transportation done, we won't have necessarily um, <clears throat> the understanding of the, the green space that we typically know. We typically have rules pretty much on, on how much open space there is for people who are living in a project and so on. So this is the most blind annexation that we've ever done in the middle of the most complex flood mitigation project we've ever done. So it's not to me to be expected that we can count on anything to move quickly except for our engineering, and that can move up to the point where we hit the regulatory process. And when we hit the regulatory process, if you don't think there's uncertainty in that, I don't think we've ever been through anything this complex. And so whether it's the core, whether it's environmental issues, we want to reopen up. Whether we take the levy down, we will be constraining our ability to relocate species and rehabilitate land. So I, I think this is just an issue where if we're expecting certainty in anything but the engineering process, and even that is going to have uncertainty at the regulatory phase, we are fooling ourselves. And so one of the reasons for the land swap is it does exactly decouple these two complicatedly intertwined things on one piece of land that reminds me nothing more than a huge, huge Hogan pan cost. Um, because it's wetland, it's a form of gravel mine, it's got slumping soils on the side of it, <clears throat> it's got a flood mitigation project going in, which has even caused CU some consternation about whether the housing that they put there will be attractive. It's got, 
it's got a half mile ish road that's going to connect over the the berm and down into where f people are living and so to me this this is a per what i'm willing to listen to is what bob had said about options i am really interested in keeping options open because if there was an option that decoupled this effectively that was agreeable to the landowner and agreeable to the community then we would we would make the job much easier we would eliminate some costs so one of the things we haven't talked a lot about are there are costs to being able to preserve the 129 acres as we do our, our flood mitigation process um, and those would come out in the wash so we do a land swap and we do equivalent value we save some money um, maybe we open up the possibility of doing slightly different flood mitigation if we can extend the 100 to be something else. But I don't understand why we need to shut this part down now, why we need to make a decision which says we're committing to this blind annexation when we don't know, we don't know exactly what we can get and what we can't get into the annexation agreement, which I think is a really important thing. I am aware that there are people in harm's way downstream, two of them sitting on this council, um, others in the room, and that is really important, and I'm glad we moved the, some decisions forward so that we are reducing uncertainty. So we know how we will move the engineering forward, but we are gonna bump into other roadblocks, I'm sorry to tell all of us in this room, the regulatory processes, Joe, do they always go smoothly? <laughs> right. So I guess I don't understand why we wouldn't begin exploring the, the CU North, as it's being called, because anything we do for that urban services study is going to benefit in the long run, whether we end up with the park there, there's a land as as Aaron mentioned to the south there's a a parcel of land that is very eager to come in and if we would need to consider both the uh, the <clears throat> area three and that at the same time then we could get potentially multiple pieces of housing if, if, if it ever came to be that CU wanted it we'd have CU's contribution to housing there and I know that the developer that owns that parcel to the south that would get tied in with this is very interested in housing. Um, I don't think that the transportation system there is developed enough um, yet, but it can be. The interconnections that would connect um, CU North, whatever, Area 3, into the, the 26th Street corridor for biking. Um, busing, I assume that buses would routinely run wherever this is located, that these pieces of housing would have um, buses that transported them to the CU main campus. So, you know, we take a look at, at what the transportation distance is. It's really not that much different. In one case, taking a car <clears throat> um, from CU South, the tennis courts to the main campus at the engineering center, 2.7 miles doing it from the um, Area 3 Planning Reserve, 3.2 miles. Doing it by bicycle, it's three miles from the tennis courts to um, the campus, and it's 3.6 miles from the Planning Reserve to campus. So these are small differences. The one thing that I do agree is right now the bus service is different, but that's something that I think CU would want to be part of in any case because that's gonna be probably part of what we're gonna to need to get into the annexation agreement. So this in no way is saying that I think annexation discussions need to shut down. We need to continue, this is my opinion, not direction from council, but we need to continue having those so we can resolve these issues. But at the same time, I don't see that we need to shut our option down for potential looking at this northern land. What's the benefit? Rachel asked this good question. What's the benefit? The land at CU South has been desired by this community for a very long time because it is such high quality habitat in some parts and it was a gravel pit that never got reclaimed properly and people love to go out there and recreate. So there would certainly be some benefits to the community of being able to make that permanently um, an amenity that they have rather than just 
temporarily an amenity they have. I do appreciate CU's contribution to have it be permeable, and I believe that that would probably be the case just as all the rest of the, the university campuses. So at the end of the day, I don't know if we'll have five people who want to consider moving the urban services study up forward, um, but it didn't sound to me like any time inside of a year, whether we had the annexation agreement completed or not, was going to slow down our engineering team starting their permitting. So correct me if I'm wrong, I believe you said about a year for the environmental permitting? Yeah, I think that's correct. Okay. So anyhow, I will leave it there, and I think what we need to do now is to the best of our abilities, make sure that staff heard what we said, because this is a study session and there are no votes. It was pretty clear to me we had consensus on the 100-year um, flood plan and moving forward with that. Um, I also heard some things I wasn't so clear about, about what issues we should carry forward to the boards and the commissions. So I will open it up. I didn't say this before, but I don't think we should revisit the issue with the levy or the berm. I think we leave ourselves much more open. It doesn't really impact our flood design team, and it, it leaves open the possibility for better environmental values there. I'm certainly no worse. Um, so how do people feel about the berm? Should we ask people this question in our community, or are we done? I, th I think one group that I would like to hear from on the berm um, is um, the Open Space Board, because there is a habitat impact, and I would, would value hearing from Open Space about whether they have an opinion on that. There may be countervailing um, uh, uh, factors from engineering, from CU, from unfill, from finance, but I, I'd love to hear what Open Space says about whether they have an opinion about whether the berm should, not now necessarily, Tom. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> thank, thank you for your earnestness, Tom. But we're, we're, we're just teeing up questions to s send to our boards and commissions over the next um, two or three months. I'm sorry you, you may not be on, on the board at that time that happens, Tom, but you can weigh in as a private individual. <laughs> um, but I, th I think that's one question that I would like our, at least that board to weigh in on when the time comes. Okay, and so we'll take that to the process committee. Do other people it, agree with that? I mean, that's fine. I think that with the 100 year plan, you don't need to make a decision on the berm anytime soon. So some input is good, but I don't think we need to figure this out right now. And if I could just respond, I think the time we would need to have it somewhat figured out is when we go in for our environmental permitting, because then we'll know <clears throat> whether we have more options inside or not. Rachel. Um, thanks. To avoid delay, though, we do need to continue moving forth with CU South annexation discussions, because otherwise we don't line up in a year, maybe, where the rubber meets the road. So in terms of what staff's hearing, I'm, I am assuming that that's true for now, that we are moving forward full steam ahead with that. That's what I heard. Um, I didn't hear anybody arguing that we didn't want to do at least parallel paths. Um, yeah, and, and I, I agree with that, that we should, as you know, I feel we should move uh, full speed ahead with that. The one one thing I want to keep in mind here is um, strain on the planning department. So, Jim, thanks for um, uh, talking about the workload. I, you know, we had a meeting with Chris Meschuk the other day and talking about the, you know, the some of the reorganizations that the planning department is working through and improving morale, improving processes. So whatever options you bring back to us, I just want to make sure that um, you take things off the table to the extent that we're uh, giving you additional things to do that we're not um, overstraining the planning department because I know you, you guys are doing really good work over there. We will, uh, yes, we will do that. Um, I, would, I would like to get clear feedback from the council tonight as to whether you want us to at least take the step of identifying what, what approximately is this, what would be the resources required to initiate uh, the baseline urban services study, not to mention all of the steps that would follow on the heels of that, um, and uh, get back to you with um, sort of our estimate on that and our proposal as to if you directed us to move forward with that, how we would respond in terms of adjusting other parts of our work plan. Um, I don't want to get six months down the road and have you ask me, how are you coming on that baseline urban services <laughs> study? And I say, I we haven't begun it yet. And so 
I would like direction from you as to whether you would at least like to, us to engage in that sort of scoping study and the tied to uh, a proposal to you or, or a recommendation to you as to how we would adjust our work plan uh, if we were to proceed with that. Can I ask a question sure. following up on that? The, the kickoff for that was planned for 2021, correct? Mm -hmm. And yes. so this would more or less be a moving it up earlier and either moving some things completely off or further down the line. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Yeah, and especially um, it would affect our work planning if if we were at the same time proceeding. If, in other words, I'll, I'll just be literal. If 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 Phil was continued to be deployed working on the annexation aspects associated with CU South, while we then had to pull other resources to look at the work associated with the baseline urban services study, that would definitely have an impact on the resources we can apply to other apply to other work priorities. Of course. Um, <clears throat> so remind me, I'm sure you told us earlier tonight, you think the annexation is about a year out? Oh, does that um, so we have a few mics that are remaining. Um, um, when we were looking at the process, we were looking at a May decision on the flood mitigation, and at that point, we didn't know if there would be land use changes, which would be subsequent to that. And so we were thinking in the summer, all of that would be buttoned up. The next steps would be a transportation analysis. The consultant suggested about three months for that. Um, you know, we're um, almost ready to begin talks with um, open space and other those other at, um, considerations. Um, and then we need to develop, um, further refine some of those devel development parameters. Um, and so I don't have a firm, I would say six, at least six months to a year probably, yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> I guess I have the floor. <laughs> I got another one. Actually, I did want to say something. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I figured you did if you right. went all the way up there to get a mic. Well, I just wanted to replenish our supply. I'd hate to go home. Um, <laughs> well, so, so I, I uh, thanks for that. Um, Phil and Jim, I, and I, I'm, I personally am a supporter of doing the urban services study. I think it's a good thing for us to do in general. Um, and, and so I guess the, the direction that, that I would give is that I, I just don't want to um, disrupt the planning department. You know, I think that, that part of what we heard from the Tipton report is that there's been uh, inconsistent direction from council and city staff is unable to kind of finish projects, that they start work on something and we switch them to something else. And it's very frustrating, it's bad for morale and such like that. So, I mean, if there's room to move the urban services study, you know, sometime into 2020, I, I'm personally, I'm fine with that in and of itself. I just don't wanna do it in such a way that it's disruptive to the department and, you know, uh, takes people off of projects that they're near getting done and would like to finish and, and, and help with the community with, so. Well, and I completely agree. Um, so I guess the question would be, how much of your time and how disruptive is it if we ask you to tell us what it could look like to, to move that forward? I think it would take, uh, well, let me back up. Um, I assume you would want, uh, in order to look at the, the, the feasibility from a staff perspective of moving forward sooner than 2021 of the baseline urban services study, because that invokes um, the deployment of resources other than the planning department, I wouldn't want to get back to you with a planning department only response, only to then find out that, oh, from the police perspective. so. I think it would take us a, uh, several weeks probably, maybe f probably say minimum four weeks, because we're gonna have to reach out across the city organization 
to come back to you with a comprehensive answer of we think we could kick it off here and here it was how it would affect planning department's work plan but also the work plans of other departments. That's going to take several weeks. So I think, um, you know, I, I would say probably minimum four weeks by the time we coordinated all that, got back to you and provided a response on behalf of the planning department, but also tried to give you a coordinated response on behalf of all of our brethren in the other departments. Thank you. Mark and then Mary. I'm going to speak loudly because... No, here, Mike's still working. Oh, no, it died. Uh, just a, f a few quick things. Um, I agree with Rachel's comment that we should be continuing the conversation about the annexation agreement uh, with all due speed. I also agree with uh, the comment that we need to try to build in as much specificity as possible so that we're not doing this blindly and we know what it is that we're annexing. And lastly, I agree with Sam's analysis to provide as much flexibility and possibility for alternatives that we can. Um, so I would be supportive of having you at least scope out what it would be, uh, what it would take to produce the study um, and let us know what has to get bumped and what can't get done as a result. Um, but I think that's, the, uh, that's an opportunity we should be taking. It's work that eventually will get done anyway, um, and I understand that we're accelerating it, um, and we will have to live with those things that, that can't get done as a consequence, and you need to tell us what those things are. Now, I have the floor. So I agree with what Mark just said. And um, one of the things that Aaron said with respect to um, finding um, a set of uh, specificity that bridges between the, um, the guiding principles and an annexation agreement would be something that we would probably need more guiding principles on. Um, but that's, but I'm not kidding. I mean, it's, it's just, it's just I, I do think we need to bridge that gap. Um, and then I agree about the, the keeping our options open. I'm not so sure that moving by the time staff goes and sees how much they can move up the baseline urban services study, the bus, um, they'll come back and it'll be, well, we can start in November. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. Let's just not do that. That's what I'm thinking. It's just, let's just not do that and keep it where it is. <clears throat> there is the the gating issue about whether or not um, CU can put housing or is willing to put housing in the CU South based on whether or not there's access from 93 and whether or not CDOT would buy into that. So that's kind of an action item for CU. But let's continue moving forward with the annexation conversation, knowing that we need to bridge that gap between the guiding principles and the level of specificity that we can all agree that we feel comfortable with, um, and find out whether or not CDOT is willing to allow a road from 93 into um, the CU South property. Serve that okay, I'll try. Anyone else want to speak on this nearby? So I think overall I'm in the same boat as Mary um, and Sam. Uh, we're keeping our options open, but I, in order to be responsible, I would need a much more um, narrowed down level of specificity. So. I would not move that forward to this year in case I needed to say that clearly. So I think I think it's pretty clear the um, majority does not want to move it up. So I don't think you need to go do an evaluation to let us know and we'll just plan. Is that kicking off? I guess one thing that I would like to hear back on, maybe others would too, is that kicking off right away in 2021 or is it later in 2021? And the idea of keeping the comp plan update open had been so that we could Uh, 
I'm, uh, I don't know that I can tell you, I, I apologize, but I don't know that I can tell you tonight that when we said 2021, was that like January 1st, 21 or 2021, or was that July 1st? I'm happy to get back to you with a more refined answer on that. I would really like to take a closer look at our work plan um, before I give you a, give all of you a firm answer to like, what did we mean exactly when we said 2021 for baseline urban services? It'll, what I'll do is we'll go back and take a more closer look, a finer grain look at our work plan and get back to you as soon as we can with a, with a response on that. No need to extend the comp plan update just for the baseline services study. So that could be done anytime. Okay. Great. So I think I've heard um, direction from council not to start it early, but we can continue having the conversation and then to work with um, <clears throat> making sure that we're continuing to make progress on the CU South annexation agreement, a little more granularity, I think I heard from multiple council members. And I think what that might mean Philip, is we might need to check in on like, what some of the details are at other study sessions because it's going to be important. What's in there is going to be important enough to council um, that I think we'll at least want to monitor it to see what's in there. Anyone else have anything they want to say? Is there anything I didn't capture right? One of them was easy. One of them we're going to talk at the process committee about what we're going to take out the boards. The only other thing from the process subcommittee last week was um, we wanted to respond to OSBT's um, written stipulations or requests or discussions, and I don't think we necessarily did that tonight. So I think that um, we sort of owe it to OSBT to have a discussion about what they have, have asked us to look at or proposed about CU South, and I don't know where that falls, but I think we need to do that. Let's take it up Thursday just as an agenda item and make sure that we come back to council with that. Okay, if everyone's good, I think we'll close this. So we made a firm decision, got some kind of weaker guidance, and then we have one more subject tonight, and this is from, this is short, this will be super short. This is from Bob. So Bob, you wanna talk about? Yeah, so next um, Wednesday and Thursday evening, we're interviewing our various applicants for the boards and commissions. And uh, in the past, our, um, sometimes in the past, our, our questions are, are somewhat spontaneous, and it's basically whoever raises their hand, and, and um, sometimes the questions are really outstanding, and sometimes they're less than entirely outstanding. And so I, I guess uh, in, my, in my perfect world, I would like, um, you know, a council member to pick a couple of boards and, and be responsible for, the, I don't care who asks the questions, I just want them to be thoughtful and intentional. Um, in my perfect world, we would all be, take a board or two and, and we would prepare the questions in advance, and Rachel does too, and Aaron does too, and so on and so forth. Um, if folks think that's too formal and structured, um, we can kind of default back to our, like whoever raises their hand first gets to ask the question. Just remember, when that question is asked, that question must be asked of each and every applicant. Um, that's our rule. And so I guess um, if, if you guys don't like the idea of assigning boards and preparing questions in advance, the minimum I would ask is that if you have a really burning question, make sure it's a really thoughtful, intention, intentional one, because we really only get about two questions out per board. And so it's not like we all get to ask a question. It's literally two, maybe three if people are really functional. So it's really disappointing if we ask two questions, they're not good questions, and then they go away, and then we're forced to ask those same two not good questions of all the other applicants as they come in the door, and then we, um, and then we don't have a whole lot to go on for making our decisions. So I'll leave it to you guys whether you want to formalize it and, and assign boards and commissions. Maybe we could do it based on the letters we read at the, at the um, before the retreat, or at least commit to, and to ask good intentional questions. Um, is there a working mic? <laughs> Mary. <clears throat> I say we stick to the way we do it, um, and we think about what we might want to ask. I, I for one, will probably wait until just before the questions come up, if even if I'm assigned board. So, I would imagine that others are in the same boat um, because things come up and you never really have. It's like, oh my God, I haven't done this, and then you do it an hour before. So, do it while you're eating dinner. <laughs> Thank you.
Junie. So I'm new to this whole process, so I don't fully know what it work, how it works. So I'm learning between now and then. So assigning would not be ideal for me. Um, can I prepare a question and send it to all of you, and then you can decide which questions should be asked? That might be something that we may consider, but I would not want to be assigned, you know, to do something that I'm, you know, that I need to take a few cues, maybe probably on the day of from a lot of you. So, Bob, I like the idea. I, I, we do have a bunch of new people. What, what if we uh, express an intention for next year to really explore that idea like a few weeks in advance? Um, uh, so that, and, and if we, because I think it's, it would be worth doing, where, where we had a little bit of notice, and maybe we, but we mix up the questions so it's not one person, one board, but we get. Yeah, questions. deja vu. Um, I think we've had this, this discussion before. each each year for the last two or three years, yeah. and every year we say, well, yeah, it's a good idea, how will we do it next year? So I'm, f I'm fine waiting until next year, and next year we'll have the same discussion, and we'll, we'll do it again. <laughs> uh, I actually do like Ginny's idea, which is an alternative, which is we all just, send a bunch of questions in on anything we care about, and then we can all look at the questions and pick a couple of them. I don't know exactly process-wise how do we do that. So uh, I, I'm fine either way. I just, my only request is that our questions be thoughtful and intentional. If you're gonna raise your hand and ask one of the two questions we're gonna get for that board, make sure it's a really good one. I don't think we can do that real easily because you'd have to put it out there. Everybody, you know what the questions would be ahead of time. And so um, just think about it. While you're showering or eating dinner, I don't know, walking the dog. Well, I mean, Bob is flagging a really good point because it does happen from time to time that we get a dog of a question that even the person who asked it's like, you know, <laughs> that wasn't so good. So, yeah, if you can be intentional about it. But the other truth about this um, process is that it's really hard for people to prepare for 120 interviews. You know, we, we are going to have two nights of a little less than 60 people each night. And so uh, sometimes, even if we had the best of intentions to get questions in beforehand, you look around and nobody sent a question in or nobody raises their hand and then somebody has to, to take care of it. So. Next year. <laughs> Next year. Thank you all. We're adjourned. <laughs>